one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. This will be part two of our interview with Philip McLemore. How are you doing, Philip? Doing great. I'm so glad that you made time in your schedule to join us again because the last time we talked with you, we spent three hours going over your experiences as a CES director and also as somewhat of a formal apologist for the LDS Church. And that took us three hours to get through all of that information. And as a consequence, we were not able to get into something else that I wanted to talk with you about, which are all the wonderful experiences that you have had with general authorities in the LDS church. And I got to tell the audience right now that the title, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, is your description and your title that you gave to these stories. Can I start out by asking you, why is it that you chose to give it that title? Well, because my, you know, I think it's a legitimate area of exploration because if you deal with senior leadership of an organization, particularly a spiritual organization, you should, through them, somehow be able to discern and experience the essence of a religion. And my experience was exactly that. Uh, much of it was really good, some of it was bad, and some of it was, uh, was ugly. Well, I want to go over it all tonight because I think it's important for purposes of being fair and accurate that we talk about good things about general authorities as well as other things that might not be considered to be so good. I Don't agree. you? I agree. Okay. Well, first off, can you also tell us how is it that you ended up being able to rub shoulders with and have these experiences with general authorities? Because if you're like most members, like me, general authorities are usually things that are only seen at a distance and only heard in public settings like general conference or something else. It's only rarely that I or pretty much most other members have a chance to actually meet a general authority. And then it might just be maybe to shake hands and be awed by their presence. Sure. Well, p part of it had to do with my jobs. Some of those experiences came about just as I, because I worked for the church educational system and I did some special projects for the church, which brought me into contact with some of the brethren. Part of it was serving as a military chaplain. Anytime a general authority would get within 50 miles of a LDS military chaplain, they were instructed to interview us. And so I met many of the brethren through those interviews over the years. And some of those interviews turned into follow-up meetings and experiences. And then I, I just had some synchronistic kind of coincidental meetings that turned out to be quite meaningful. So it was really a combination of things. Well, I'm really looking forward to hearing about these stories. Now, I know you mentioned one story already in our prior interview regarding Elder Hinckley, uh, who was not president at the time, I believe, and also Correct. Marvin J. Ashton. Correct. So, so we, that, yeah. yeah. So, you know, President Hinckley was very positive and helpful to me as a young missionary. We talked about his sharing of his personal view of the priesthood restriction policy. And then... Right. That was the one where I characterized it as sort of blaming the members. Correct. And then the episode with uh, Elder Ashton was when, was when uh, the church became aware there were irregularities in my mission, and he came down to correct that. In person, he was impressive. His teaching was powerful but he was completely deceived by my mission president and I was quite disheartened when he left that, that he really didn't discern what was actually going on in my mission. So those were those two experiences. Right. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? Oh yeah. Now, if I can, before we dive in, I'd like to clarify one thing. Uh, I actually had two mission presidents. The first one will remain unnamed and it was, the first 13 months of my mission. And that was when all of those crazy, crazy things took place that I talked about last time. I do not want those things to bleed over into my second mission president, who was absolutely fabulous. Uh, I'm going to mention his name, Nelson Baker, just because he was such a, an amazing 
person. He turned that mission completely around in a positive way. He loved the missionaries. He built faith in the missionaries. He never missed an interview. He, he personally ministered and cared for every missionary individually. And he would only accept good baptisms, not crazy baptisms. And the baptismal rate went down tremendously. And I know he took a lot of heat from above, but he, he devoted himself to doing the right thing. So I just didn't want all those crazy missionary stories to somehow bleed over into him. His reputation was spotless. Right. So uh, President Baker, your second mission president, did he go on to become a general authority? He did not. Did your first mission president go on to become a general authority? Um, he was pushing for it, but he contracted a nasty cancer Ooh. and died rather quickly. So uh, that plan did not work out for him. Mm, okay. Um, yeah. All right. So let's go back to your chronology in your life. And let's talk about the experiences that you've had with different journal authorities that we may yeah. have heard of. Now, I, I'm sorry for one more diversion. I'd like to say a few words about my wife, and I mainly because she's going to be a participant in several of these stories. Okay, sure. So with your permission. <clears throat> uh, without exaggerating or just trying to be nice, so I get uh, a special dinner tonight. Is she there uh, listening, by the way? No, no, okay. she's, she's uh, doing kind of her morning spiritual practice. Okay, great. My wife, and I mean this with all sincerity, is literally an angel descended from heaven. Literally an angel descended from heaven? I'm not exaggerating. Her mind and her heart are absolutely pure. She's a person of perfect honesty and integrity. She has an amazing ability to, ability to love, particularly children and animals. Um, so I, I just want to get that on the record. Now, in spite of being aware of most of the troubling issues of the church, unlike me, who has felt ultimately misled and betrayed, she loves the church. She's loyal to the church. She has hope for improvement, and she's absolutely personally devoted to that improvement. So I, I just wanted to make that, I wanted to be clear about the kind of person she is, and I wanted to be clear about the, that distinction between us. Okay, very good. And, um, and then the other thing about her is, is magical and amazing things happen to her and pop up in her life. And uh, some of that might come out as we talk about these experiences. Okay, great. But, I'm really looking forward to it. Okay. So, in order, when I was a 25-year-old graduate student at the University of Florida, I was selected to teach the evening institute classes there. So, I was going to graduate school and then teaching all of the evening classes at the institute. And, <clears throat> pardon me. And as it turned out, um, Elder Ezra Taft Benson, who was the president of the Quorum of the Twelve at the time, was conducting a meeting in the central Florida region for regional representatives, stake presidents, and bishops. This was a private meeting. It was invitation only. And it was being held in my ward building. I tried to be a part of the meeting. My, my uh, CES boss and stake president told me absolutely not that it was uh, by invitation only and, you know, pure priesthood business within that context. So I agreed to that and then promptly forgot about the meeting. Well, a couple of weeks later, I was asked to substitute teaching a Sunday school class for a friend. So I went over to the ward building to go down to the library and to get the gospel the Sunday school manual mm -hmm. so I could prepare for the class. So as I'm walking down the hallway, I'm passing the Relief Society room, and suddenly I hear the voice of Elder Ezra Taft Benson, president of the 12. That wonderful, somewhat high-pitched, reedy voice that we all know and love. 
Absolutely. Well, this is one of those relief society rooms in the older chapels where you had two doors. One door would lead you into the front of the room and the other door would lead you into the back of the room. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> as I'm passing that front door, I hear his voice. And of course, I'm 25 years old. I'm mainstream, complete, believing, love the church, love the Brethren Mormon. I hear that voice. I am so excited. I put my ear to that door and I'm trying to pick up some pearls. You know what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I just have to believe revelation is absolutely flowing in there. And this has got to be the really good stuff because it's such an exclusive meeting. <laughs> That's exactly right. So I got my ear pressed to the door. Well, those doors are thick wood and I, I just couldn't hear hardly anything. So I'm standing out there and I'm thinking, okay, I don't belong in this meeting, but holy smokes, the president of the Quorum of the Twelve is in there. You know, the heavens are open. Revelation is pouring. I, I got to get some of this, even a minute. You know what I'm saying? Just a minute. So I thought, you know, I'm going to slip in there. So I went to the back door. And in my mind, I envisioned just cracking that door, slipping in, sitting in the very, very back seat against the back wall, picking up a few pearls, getting inspired, and then slipping back out without anybody seeing me. <laughs> yeah, you just want to touch the hem of his garment. That's exactly right. So anyway, I open the door, I slip in, and I close it real fast. It was wall-to-wall -wall chairs. There wasn't one empty chair anywhere. Oh, no. I'm stuck. The door's shut. People in the back are starting to look at me. I don't want any attention being drawn to myself. So I literally fell to the floor. And I'm crawling on my hands and knees, and I'm moving back to the door <laughs> on my hands and knees. The idea was to reach up with just my hand, open the door, and then crawl out without anything <laughs> being seen. <laughs> well, anyway, President Benson, who's up front, saw me come in. And rather than allow me to, to uh, crawl out in shame, as I should have, he stops the meeting and he goes, young man, young man, I see you don't have a chair. So I stood up, kind of smiled and waved at him. And I said, oh, sir, I am so sorry. I'm obviously in the wrong room. I'm going to leave now. <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh, no, no, no. He said, I want you to come up here. I have a special seat for you. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, Lord, save me. So he's waving me forward. So I went ahead and walked up that middle aisle. I got up to the front. And he says, there's not an empty chair in the whole place. I said, I know. That's why I'm leaving. And he said, oh, here, I got this for you. So he walked over to the piano, grabbed the piano stool, pulled it out into the front and center of the room sat me on the piano stool and then put his hands on my shoulder and continued his instruction to the priesthood leaders. Oh my gosh. What was that like? Tragically in the front row facing me, no, you know, face to face side by side is my CES boss stake president and my Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> The ones who told you you couldn't come to the meeting. <laughs> That's right. They looked at me. There was such shock and horror on their faces. And and uh, uh, Jim, my uh, my boss, stake president, uh, surrogate father, um, mouths to me. You know what are you doing? You, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I could mouth back was. Um, be kind to me. I have friends in high places. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like the apostles in the New Testament saying to Jesus, what are you doing with these kids? Get them away from you. And he has to tell them, hey, these are the important ones, not you. Oh, gosh. So anyway, I sat there through the whole meeting. When it came time to sing hymns in the middle, he sat next to me on the piano bench. We shared the book. Oh, my gosh. He get, would get up behind me, put his hands on my shoulder again, continue the teaching. And then when the meeting was over, he shook my hand. He said, thanks for sharing this meeting with me. And, you know, I got out of there as quickly as possible before any uh, 
beatings and tortures were administered. Uh, when I got out the door, I thought, you know, why did he do that? And mm -hmm. I, the best I could come up with is, and, and this was the impact on me, will I ever sneak into a meeting I'm not invited to anymore? Absolutely never. <laughs> <laughs> and whether he had that kind of wisdom psychology thing going, I don't know. He treated me as kind and as interesting as could be, but I got the lesson pretty clearly. Um, you know, mind your own business. Well, yeah, but you know, obviously he could have done that and given that message in a much uh, more critical way oh, yeah. by simply saying, are you supposed to be in this meeting? And you're saying no and say, well, then I'm afraid you need to leave right now. No, he did just the opposite. It had the same effect and uh, it left me with, a, you know, a very, very positive feeling for him and experience with him. So, yes. Uh, and as controversial a figure as he was, your story makes me realize there's a human side to him and a warm side to him and that he's not, all bad or all good any no. more than I'm yeah. all bad or all good or anybody's all bad or all good. No, he had, he obviously, I didn't know until then, but he obviously had this very interesting fun side. Mm -hmm. The other thing that dawned on me as I reflected on this um, is this issue of the members worship of general authorities. And I, I don't know that that's too strong of a word. Um, there is this mythology of, you know, of the brethren seeing and talking with Jesus, of having this direct revelation. And, and can and, I just say here that that is a mythology that is promoted, fostered, and taught by the leaders themselves? I agree. I okay. agree. And <clears throat> when I was in my previous ward about eight years ago, I was in the high priest group, and we used to meet in the high council room. And as so it's the big you know it was a room with the big giant table and so forth and one day as as i was walking out of the room the high priest group leader an older gentleman very faithful member uh leader of the church uh he we just started chatting about different things and we suddenly looked up on the wall in all along the wall of the high council room there were the pictures of the first presidency every member of the quorum of the 12 and then far over on the left there was a where was a you know a smaller presence of a picture of jesus and he just stood there reflecting and he looked at me and he said you know he says it troubles me that sometimes we seem to worship the brethren more than jesus well that experience must have had an impact on him because the next fast and testimony meeting he got up and in the testimony meeting, he, he said, he shared that with the whole ward. He said, you know, brothers and sisters, sometimes I'm afraid we worship the brethren more than we do our Savior. And I think we need to get our attention focused back on, on the Savior. And I thought, wow, you know, I, I thought that was a great testimony. You know what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. Man, the bishop called him in. Uh, uh, what's the right word? Upbraided, chastised. Those are the words. Excoriated. Corrected. Eviscerated. <laughs> <laughs> Emasculated. Okay, I think, I think we got it. <laughs> and if that wasn't enough, the stake president on top of that felt like he needed to do the same thing. So I guess by the mouth of two witnesses. So he he got tore up by the by the stake president also, which I, that maybe we've been focusing too much on the leaders of the church and not enough on Jesus. Yes. Which really just confirmed his distress and fear, right? Yes. There's too much Jesus around here. And, and it reminded me of, uh, I remember a podcast I listened to, oh, three or four years ago on Mormon stories where this couple who had left the church were telling their story and the, the man was recounting an experience he had with his state president. The state president called him in and wanted to know about his faith crisis and how things were being managed and, to, you know, to try to encourage him and so forth. And in an effort to, to um, 
encourage or to give some hope to the state president, this gentleman said, uh, well, president, I want you to know that even though I'm having a, a faith crisis, which really means church crisis. Right. He said, uh, I just want you to know that I still believe in God and I still believe in Jesus. And in this interview, this, this, uh, church brother or this church brother reported that the state president said to him i don't care if you believe in god or jesus i want to know if you have a testimony that thomas s monson is a prophet of god right that's the important thing that is really the important thing so anyway as i was reflecting on this incident with uh with elder benson that all that stuff kind of flowed into my mind so anyway all right can I tell you my story about Ezra Taft Benson? Sure. It's not going to be anywhere near as good as your story in terms of personal connection. He, ne- he actually never touched my body during the course of the story or even talked to me during the course of my story. <laughs> but still, it was a very formative story for me. So I'll try and share it here as quickly as possible, okay? I haven't shared this before on the show, to my recollection. Anyway, so this is back in, I think it's, uh, it's the 1980s. I think it's the last half of the 1980s. Uh, Ezra Tapp Benson is now president of the church. I am a member of the student ward. I'm also the mission uh, leader, the ward mission leader in the student ward. And my first wife is also a stake missionary or a ward missionary. I think they called them stake missionaries back then. Anyway, we get word, and this is in Austin, Texas, where we are. So we get word that President Ezra Tapp Benson is making the rounds, and he's going to be in San Antonio, which is just about uh, an hour and a half down I-35 from Austin. And he's going to be there, I think it was on a Saturday night, and he's going to be giving a, an address to all the missionaries. And all the missionaries in the area are invited, including uh, stake missionaries. And this was mentioned in, in my ward, and I think it was mentioned by uh, probably the stake mission leader. And I wanted to make sure, I say, are you sure that everybody can go, including, you know, women? Can women go to this too? Yeah, as long as they're stake missionaries, everybody can go. So I said, okay, great. This is going to be a great opportunity. So my first wife and I, we make arrangements to go down there to San Antonio on this night. And we get there. We don't get there super early, but we get there early enough, probably half an hour early. You know, we don't want to be left out in the cold. And we walk into the Steak Center in San Antonio, Texas. I'd never been to it before, but you know the format. Everybody knows the format of a Steak Center. And we walk down the long aisle that leads to the double doors that go into the chapel. And that's past, of course, you know, the different offices down that hallway. Well, we walk down that hallway and there are two missionaries standing on each side of the door. The doors are closed, but obviously there's a lot of people in there. It's probably already pretty much packed by that point, just in anticipation of Ezra Taft Benson arriving and addressing everybody. It's a big deal, right? So we walk up to these two missionaries and they look at, me and they look at my first wife and they say, okay, well you can go in, but she can't. And I said, what? And they said, yeah, this is only for the priesthood. And I'm going, well, that's not what I was told. Well, I'm sorry. That's the way it is. This is only for priesthood and only guys can go in. So you can go in, but she can't. So I said, okay, well, uh, you can imagine that I was feeling a little bit hot under the collar about this, but what am I going to do? Right? So I said, okay, I'll go in. You stay out here. No, actually, I didn't do that. (laughs) I didn't do that. That thought didn't even cross my mind, I don't think. So I said, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll just sit here on the couch. There's nobody else in this, um, the foyer, right? Or as Mormons call it, the foyer. Yes. There's nobody in that area because they're all inside. There's just those two missionaries. So we'll just sit there on the couch, right? And it'll be piped out, I expect, over the speaker system. We'll just sit there. We'll listen to it. And, you know, it'll be good, okay? This isn't something that I have to lose my testimony over. But I was still a little bit miffed about it, having been misinformed and everything, and about this whole exclusivity idea that is really being highlighted and emphasized and underlined for me during this experience. So everybody, those missionaries, I think they go, it's just me and my first wife sitting there on the couch in the foyer. Nobody else is there. And I start looking down that hallway because the couch is facing down that hallway that we walked up, right? The long hallway. Sure. It splits in a T and goes off in both directions. And I start seeing some, some movement down there, some activity down there at the other end. And there's people who are walking in. And uh, what happens is, is that all of a sudden I realize that, excuse me for a second. I don't know if that sound, I'm going to turn off my email. I just had something come in. 
Okay. So anyway, I look down the hallway. There's, there's guys in black suits, right? Or dark suits and white shirts and ties. You know, they're Mormons, right? And oh, yeah. I can't remember if they actually had sunglasses on, but it, was, it occurred to me that these, this is security. These, this is the entourage for President Benson. And he has to get in the chapel some way, and he's not in there yet. He's going to be coming down the hallway, and he's going to walk right past us. So, of course, we'd stand up. But this is going to be our, our opportunity. And, of course, he'll see us there, and he'll say, oh, hello, and he'll shake our hands. We're going to have this great opportunity. So this bad situation is going to be made good by the fact that, well, serendipity, synchronicity is how I think you said it, right? Right. Very excited about it. Well, we see a few more of these guys, these security guys, uh, in the hallway. And then one of them comes down the hallway to us, right? Ezra Benson has not entered the building yet. But one of these guys comes down the hallway and says, okay, you're going to have to move. What? We're not going to be able to stand here when he comes? No, you have to move because nobody can be here when he comes in. Oh, no. Great. Okay. So we can't go in the chapel. We can't be in the foyer. So what we have to do is we have to walk all the way around through the hallways, you know, in the stake center, all the way down, all the way back, all the way down the other side to the foyer, the small foyer on the other side. And so that's what we do so that he could enter the building. We don't even get to see him walk down there because security will not allow it. So we go down there, we go up to the other side. And then when we get to the other side, what we find there is that that is the foyer or the foyer where all the women are. All the women who had heard or understood or been told incorrectly that they could come to this meeting are now jam-packed in this smaller foyer on the other side of the building. And that is where we are. And I am the only guy with all these women who are milling about. There's only a limited number of chairs there. Most of them are standing or sitting. And I remember to this day feeling the exclusion that women feel only because I was among them. Now, I was voluntarily among them, right? I could go in if I wanted. I did. They couldn't go in even if they wanted. So it's not exactly the same, but I experienced it to some degree, and I didn't like it. Oh, yeah. And I really felt that everybody here was being treated as a second-class citizen, including me. And I remember to this day that even though they were being treated as second-class citizens, one sister uh, who I know must have been a missionary, um, she was uh, Hispanic or Latina, as we call it today. And, of course, they believe that President Benson is a prophet just as much as the missionaries on the inside of the chapel, and maybe more so. But I remember that he obviously came in the other side because we hear the sound of everybody standing up and everybody breaks into, we thank the O God for a prophet, right? Oh, gee. And so they do that, and uh, obviously he makes it to the front of the the stand, and he begins talking. And while he's talking, this sister has the absolute temerity to go up to those two doors, to open the door on the right just a smidge, and peek in through the slit in the door to get a glimpse of the prophet of God. And I will never forget to this day the beatific look that came over her face. That even though she was excluded from the meeting and in the court of the women, so to speak, that she was able to get a glimpse through a door and past the shoulders of the missionaries who are standing on the other side of that door protecting it, right, of her beloved prophet. So that's my story about Ezra Taft Benson. It had nothing to do with him. And, you know, honestly, from your story, I got a feeling that if he were in charge, right, and if... If the sister missionary, okay, who had peeked open and he had seen that or something, he might have said, come on in, come on in, come on, sit up here, right? For all I know, he would have done that. He would not, and I don't know that he would because that's a woman, you're a guy, so I don't know. But I have this feeling that in some instances that the members of the church put the leaders of the church on a higher pedestal than the leaders of the church put themselves on. Oh, Interesting. I think not, that's probably true. Not always, because, you know, there's always yeah. the Elder Bednar exception. Right. right. In that rule. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think in, uh, that would be true in many of the experiences I've had with a number of the brethren. So. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I did mean to belabor <laughs> with that story, cause, um, but I wanted to share that because that's, you see, this is the kind of story that regular members of the church like me have with general authorities, Right. 
They're kind of at a distance. They're not so close up and personal as yours. But you have you have another one, and I think it involves it. Is it M. Russell Ballard? So Elder Ballard interviewed me for my full-time CES position. So when you're hired full-time with CES, you have to be interviewed by one of the brethren. At that time in, um, oh gosh, late 70s, Elder Ballard was a member of the 70, and his area of supervision was the southern states. So he had me come over from Auburn, Alabama, where I was at the Institute Director, to Atlanta, Georgia, to meet in a stake center there. And two weeks earlier, I had just met my wife at a special interest um, conference, regional conference, and had called her to ask her for a date. So our first date was this interview with that I had with Elder Ballard. Uh, your first date was an interview with Elder Ballard? Yeah, that was my, you know, I called my wife. I said, hey, my wife, I, I called Kim. We were, we just had one meeting at that special interest conference and I called her for a date and I said, I'm going to be in Atlanta meeting with Elder Ballard. Do you want to go? And so. So instead of dinner and a movie, it's dinner and an interview. <laughs> it was, it was interview and a lunch. <laughs> so, but she didn't um, go in. She had to wait outside. Right? Correct. Okay. She, okay. Uh, she was in the the women's court. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I began working with Elder Ballard in the region council meetings that he directed and I was the area CES director. So I was in all of those meetings. And then my, I I mentioned this in the last interview that the church hired me full time, not knowing I was a single person. They don't like to do that. And for wise reasons, they don't want single CES guys, right? dating among students and so forth. Right. So, because they never any, have any trouble with the married CES guys. <laughs> so in any case, our um, relationship developed quite quickly. And I suddenly had a problem. My wife had been, had been previously sealed in the temple. Her husband had been grossly unfaithful. And after six years of marriage, they divorced. And of course, you can't get a cancellation of temple sealing until you remarry. So I had proposed, but now we were facing having to wait a year. That was the church policy to have her sealing canceled before we could be married in the temple. Right. But you're on the cusp of getting hired or you've already been hired. Oh, I've already been hired. So, so the dilemma was I'm, here I am, a, 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 an Institute of Religion director, and <clears throat> I'm supposed to set the example. Of course, they want, you know, they want men who've served missions and are married in the temple. And can I back, back up just a second? Because I think you covered it in the prior interview. Sure. But you got interviewed for the position. You got called to the position. And apparently the person who interviewed you just sort of assumed that you were married without actually making sure that you were. Well. Is that right? When I was hired by CES, this Jim that I refer to, who was my stake president and CES boss, he just he he liked me, he nurtured me, and he hired me. He he he. I didn't go through the normal seminary process of supervision and supervised teaching at BYU and the around Salt Lake City. I was hired off the street and put directly into the position. So the people at the central office at CES really didn't know me they just trusted Jim and they didn't know that I was unmarried <laughs> as a matter of fact uh, I can't remember if I told this or not but a CES guy flew out from Salt Lake City to meet with me and put his finger and poked me on the chest and he says we don't hire single people you slip through the cracks he says if you're not married in the next uh, eight to ten months we're not renewing your contract so they even gave me a time frame in which I had to be married wow Okay, it's so it's in, this, in, it's in this context then that you happen to meet. Oh, yeah. And just a little follow-up on that. So what happened was I met Kim soon after that. Kim was divorced and had three children. We got married within, um, oh, probably five months of the time that we met. And so my, my succeeding CES boss was on the fl- phone with this um, – staff member at church headquarters. Now, Philip, I'm sorry. When you say you got married five months after you met, that's civilly? Well, no. We okay. Got married, yeah, it'll, I'll, I'll circle around. So. Okay, I apologize. Anyway, this CES guy in Salt Lake City who's upset they've got a single guy out there 
was asking you know about me so he, he questioned my new boss and he said hey has Phil gotten married or not and he said to the uh, to this uh, headquarters official he said oh sir he absolutely took your counsel to heart it's only been five months and I'd like to report to you that he's not only married they already have three children <laughs> So he said, oh, really? <clears throat> well, okay. So let me ask you the question so you can finish the story, and I'll try not to interrupt with these All right. uh, questions. But how was it then that if the regular member in the regular course of business has to wait for a year in order to be sealed in the temple to a person who uh, was in your wife's position, um, how did you get married in five months' time instead of having to wait a year? Well, I approached Elder Ballard after a region council meeting and I said, sir, I have a problem. I'm the Institute director at Auburn university. I'm single. I'm get. I'm engaged. We're going to, we want to be married soon. And the problem is I'm supposed to be the example and we have to decide whether to get married soon civilly. And there was some pressure to do that because I'm in Alabama. She's in Atlanta, Georgia. So, we could only get together on weekends. She's got these three young children that need a father. So to wait a year just didn't seem to be the right thing to do for our relationship and for those children. So I said to Elder Ballard, sir, I, I want your counsel. I'll do whatever you advise. If, if it's the best thing for us to get married soon for the sake of the family and get married civilly and then be sealed in the temple a year later, we'll do that. Um, I, I just, do you want us to wait the year and not get married or should we get married civilly and do the temple ceiling in a year? So he paused for just a second and he said, well, he said, uh, if you'll give me a week, I'll get back with you with an answer. I said, that'd be fine, sir. So a week later, my wife's stake president got a call from Elder Ballard's secretary and said that her, temple ceiling had been canceled and that we could go immediately and be sealed in the temple without the waiting period. And what had happened was when Elder Ballard got back to Salt Lake City, he, he got into the flow of the paperwork. He found the, the paperwork that had been sent up through her state, state president for the cancellation of ceiling. He literally walked it down to President Kimball's office, walked in, laid it on President Kimball's desk, asked him to sign it. President Kimball signed it. And then um, his secretary called uh, Kim's stake president, told us we could go anytime we wanted. So it is not what you know, it's who you know. And I have to be honest, I, we were so grateful. I mean, I was so thankful for his intervention like that. It was a, a blessing for us at the time, certainly. And it kept me, you know, being the example. It was, and we, I love to tell the story because it made me feel special, right? Right, absolutely. But then the feeling of, the, the, the feeling of being special suddenly turned into, this is sick. Um, why do I want to tell a story that makes me feel special when the average member doesn't get this kind of attention or privilege? And, and so, you know, it raises the whole issue of, you know, of, of privilege and to some degree elitism in the church. Um, and then I think sometimes about the, the whole issue of the second anointings. I mean, we have this secret elite upper class within the church of leaders, really leaders, right? General authorities, uh, mission, select mission presidents and select BYU scholars and so forth that, are called in and and given their second anointing and of course it's all very secret and hush hush and so forth uh, surprisingly most members still are not aware of that um, it, it kind of troubles me you know it troubles me that there's a, a secret elite among us so to speak and you know I got a small taste of that again it was a blessing but the the flip side of that is it's, I find that to be a disturbing element. Right. Well, Joseph Smith's secret quorum of the anointed is still with us in a very real way, isn't it? Absolutely. 
And I understand what you're saying, because on the one side, we know that there's all these rules and all these policies and any organization is going to have them. And the bigger the organization, the more they're going to have. Right. And they're there for a reason. And sometimes that reason makes sense. Probably in most cases, the reason makes some degree of sense. But there's always going to be exceptions to that rule. And we like the idea that leaders can use their discretion to figure out where this is an exception to the rule and this isn't, and bend those rules in accordance with common sense and, and maybe the dictates of the spirit or, or whatever you want to say, right? So all that's a good thing, I think. But then I see what you're saying where it seems that, yes, are you there? You, you, you broke up for about 20 seconds. Oh, okay. So let me go back there uh, and say that I think that we can all understand why it's a good thing where leaders can see places where the rules should be deviated from and exceptions made like in your case. But once again, like you say, the leaders are so removed from the average members of the church that those exceptions seem to get made when they're made only for people who are in the sights of or in the attention of the leaders of the church or close enough to the leaders of the church to get those exceptions because they're the only ones who can make the exceptions to the rule. And that gets to that elitism you're talking about, I think. Correct, correct. So I, yeah, I agree completely. And then there's, um, I think there's a, a story that you have about a general authority that not only are you not going to name, you don't even know the name of this general authority. Yeah, it was a little strange. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, back in, I think it was the early 80s, I, I believe what happened was a number of, of LDS women uh, were feeling imposed upon by their husbands for certain sorts of sexual activities that they didn't want to participate in. Well, what are we talking about here? <laughs> I mean, what are we talking about? Is this a PG rated show? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, uh, you don't have to actually, uh, you can describe it anyway. Are you talking about oral sex? Yes, yes, that was the topic. And Well, there's the oral sex controversy because when well, I joined the church back in the 1970s, the church members were told, don't do it. Absolutely. That's sodomy, and, baby. Uh -uh. And, and finally, I don't know if you remember, I've got the letters here, but somewhere around 1981, the first presidency issued a letter to priesthood leaders. And it said, the, it said, quote, the first presidency has determined that oral sex is an impure, unholy, and there's a third thing there, uh, practice and should not be engaged in something to that effect. Yeah. The consequence of that was... I wonder how oh, they came to that determination, but that's beside the point. Go ahead. I know, I know. Anyway, the consequence of that was all across the church, a bunch of bishops and stake presidents began adding that to the temple recommend interview. Mm -hmm. and, and so when couples would come in, they would ask, start asking questions, had very intimate questions about their marital relations. Yeah, when they get to the law of chastity, right? Absolutely. And, and so... Uh, you know, here I am. I'm, I'm in an where I'm in a temple recommend interview with my stake president, and I'm telling you, this is an exceptional stake president, devoted, committed, caring guy. Blessed many, many, many people, but he got on this oral sex thing, based on that statement. So he's asking and, you if you have oral sex with your wife. Yeah, and 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 not only that, he was holding firesides among adults and publicly teaching, you know, this should be refrained from or your blessings are going to be cut off. And so here I am sitting in front of him in this meeting and he starts asking the question. And, you know, I said, President, I absolutely love you. I'm not answering that question. It's completely inappropriate. And it's none of the church's business. And he said, well, if you don't answer the question, you're not going to get a temple recommend. Well, for me, that is significant because whether I worked for CES or whether I was a military chaplain representing the church, my job, my financial stability and security was dependent upon maintaining a temple recommend. So threatening to take my recommend is a serious threat. You see? Yes. Yes, I do. So, you know, we went back and forth and he wasn't going to give me the recommend. And I said, President, I just would like you to do one thing for me, and I trust you to do it. I am not going to go around you. Would you please speak with your 70 general authority supervisor and ask him 
do you really want to do this? Do you really want to start cutting people off that don't, that are not willing to answer this question? So he did it. He, you know, he called, talked with his general authority, 70 supervisor, called me back into the office. He said, Brother McLemore, I don't agree with, he, he slid my temple recommend across to me. He said, I absolutely don't agree with the counsel he gave told me to give you your, well, then maybe, I can't remember, four months, five months later, didn't see, that indicated, it recognized that they became aware a lot of the brethren were bringing this up in interviews, and they in essence said, look, don't do this. Don't add questions to the Temple Recommend interview, and don't talk about this practice unless the couples themselves bring it up. Okay. And so that second letter that came out from the first presidency, probably, I don't know, a year after the first one, um, finally did that Finally, did that problem, Philip? which was good. We Philip, had just I, I, fellowshiped Philip, a family into the Philip, church. Philip, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So I think you just did what yeah. I did earlier because we have a bit of an unstable connection ah. to Zoom. But I think we picked up on everything that you said, that you had told your state president or asked him to go to his boss and see if he really wanted to do this. And his boss told him, no, you don't really want to do this. And he gave okay. you a simple recommend anyway, right? Okay. That's no, right? Sir. Yes. Okay, good. So I'll, I'll, I'll press on. Well, I think that, you know, why is it, what is it about you that makes you stand up to your state president when the vast majority, obviously, of Mormons going through their temple recommend interviews with the state president being asked the same question, don't? I don't know. It's just there are certain things that are so obviously wrong in me, and I just cannot submit him oppressive. I don't know where that came from. Probably my mother. I think it'd be Satan. <laughs> Could it be? <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying anything bad about your mom, but really. Um, no, this is the kind of thing that makes a person not a good Mormon. I know. I... I you know, what's really strange is I've done this on a number of occasions, and strangely, 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 I've had some of these conflicts with local leaders, and in every single case, I have been supported by the general authority up the chain. There'll be more of these stories throughout our interview today. Okay, and, and that kind of goes along with the idea that maybe they don't take themselves or things as seriously or slavishly, maybe the right word as the local authorities like your state president. I agree. I, I mean, in every case I've had conflict with the state president, and I've had several, and it goes up chain. I, to my surprise, I always assumed they would support the priesthood leader, correct? Right. In every one of those cases, when I have brought something up, I've been the one that's been supported. Well, you know, and I think it plays into this human characteristic, at least within a militaristic or patriarchal organization, where the underlings, if I can call them that, the lower level leaders, uh, can seek to achieve um, recognition and approbation from their bosses up the chain by being extremely rigid and extremely dogmatic and thinking that that will get them approbation and perhaps even promotion from their higher ups. And then they find out that their higher ups really aren't as committed to them being that dogmatic as the lower leaders think they would be. Yeah, our connection's bad. You're, you're fading in and out. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Gosh. So, so go ahead and talk about the tragedy that you've experienced with friends of yours in relation to the asking of these kind of questions during Temple Recommend interviews. Well, there's this wonderful family that lived near us. I mean, just two lovely, wonderful people, um, loving family, just great, great people. And we introduced them to the gospel. We sent the missionaries to their house. We participated in the discussions. We fellowshiped them into the church and into our ward. And I mean, it was just a model, you know, missionary, you know, family to family sharing. And so a year had passed and they were now getting their temple recommend interviews to be able to go and be sealed in the temple. Very excited, very excited. 
and they were at the stake center getting an interview with a member of the stake presidency. It was during this time period. It was on a Saturday evening, and I just happened to be there. I was doing a, a seminary, a statewide seminary program in the chapel. And I saw them walk through, and I saw them sitting out in the hallway next to the stake president's office as I was doing the seminary presentation. And I saw them go into the stake presidency's office, and then I saw them come out. And when they came out, they had a look of shock on their faces. They were completely pure white and stunned, seriously disturbed. And so when the seminary meeting was over, I went, they were still in the hallway. I went out and sat down with them. And I said, oh, gosh, what's wrong? And they said, he asked us about our sex life. And what we yeah, do, he asked them what about their sex life. Do and shouldn't do. I mean, they were just stunned. Yeah. He yes, asked them about their sex life. Yes. And then, and then counseled them about what was appropriate and not appropriate in their marital relationships. Well, long story short, you know, she, these are prophets, seers, and revelators, and we're going to eliminate this from our marriage. And he was like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, I like I this too much. <laughs> I don't think this is any, <laughs> I don't think Sorry. this is any of their business. Well, no, it's not. And that conflict ended up in their divorce and the fragmentation of that family. Because she felt she wanted to be obedient and he felt this is none of their business. Correct. Oh, wow. So, you know, when you have authoritarian leadership and intrusive, unwise policies, people get hurt, period. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and I will tell you, everybody gets hurt in my view because those who follow slavishly, they get hurt through, being, through following slavishly. Yes. And those who do not get hurt by being marginalized, and sometimes excommunicated. Well, yeah, they, they don't develop spiritual independence, which is what true spiritual leadership should be promoting. Right. Yeah. So anyway, um, next one, I, I, this just popped into my head. This is one I had forgotten about. Um, I was still at Auburn, and I, the stake center was in Montgomery, Alabama, and we had a stake president that was – um, I don't people want to be unkind, but he was certifiably insane. And, <laughs> and he would get up in state conference and he would tell these crazy, crazy stories about how the spirit would guide him and direct him to do these very unusual things. Now, I've got to ask you, Philip, these are the kind of stories that we generally consider faith promoting. But you're saying there was something about these stories that made them not faith promoting and into the realm of no, they were unusual, and everybody knew they were unusual. Well, what was the what was the Holy Spirit directing the state president to do? Can you give us a for instance? Oh, I remember at one time in state conference, um, the spirit in the middle of the night, two at night, the spirit woke he and his wife up and told them there was impending danger, there was going to be a natural disaster, and that they should hunker down in between, you know, in a doorway somewhere. So they spent hours sitting in this doorway waiting for a natural disaster that never occurred. It and never so happened. It never happened. <laughs> there's no end to the story. There's no, there's no boffo finish there. Well, guess what? What? <laughs> we, we, everyone in the stake was saved from this natural disaster because of the stake president's obedience to that prompting of the spirit. Oh, so because he and his wife were woken up by the Spirit and told to go hunker down in the doorway because of the impending natural disaster, because of their faith, the natural disaster that they had to hide from never materialized. And we were saved. You know, this is sounding an awful lot like Elder Holland's story about wrong roads. Yes. Yes. So, I mean... This one's wrong doorways, though. Yeah, and... And I have to admit, nobody was buying it. And most members of the stake were kind of disturbed. Well, I sure word got out to Salt Lake, and they sent Elder Howard W. Hunter out to release him and to call a new stake president. And so <clears throat> it was during a stake conference. Well, I just happened to show up at the chapel a couple of hours early. And I was visiting with a seminary teacher in the area, and it meeting got up early so i ran over to the stake center and lo and behold i run into elder hunter and he and i are alone so we sit and start chatting 
very engaging, very friendly. And, and then finally he had his meeting with the individual that was going to be called as the new state president. This was a man that I knew. I was friends with his family. He had only been a member of the church for six years. He was an attorney. And I think they wanted to call a level-headed professional person, even though he had little experience in the church, six years. They, they, you know, in areas like Montgomery, Alabama, back in the 60s, to get experienced leadership was not an easy thing, right? Yeah, you got a limited pool there. And so, you know, they called this man. And because he was a, you know, a professional person, you know, competent, they they assumed he would avoid the difficulties of of the previous state president <clears throat> and the church kind of ha- excuse me and the church kind of has a soft spot in its heart for lawyers let's admit <laughs> anyway um so as the he was called to be the state president i was happy because i knew him i was friends with the family and then all of a sudden he and i started ending up in conflict because willy-nilly he was starting to change some of the policies of the church educational system that I was hired to enforce or promote or defend. Mm -hmm. And I sat down in a meeting with him and I said, sir, you know, when a state takes on the seminary and Institute program, it comes as a package, right? Yeah. And, and things are done a certain way and priesthood leaders are supposed to support that. And he said to me, look, brother, this is my stake. I am the high priest. I'm the one that gets inspiration and all things in this stake are done my way. And then he shared with me his interview with elder Hunter. Okay. Yeah. And in the, he was feeling a bit insecure. He'd only been a member of the, of the church for six years. He, in his own mind was trying to figure out how do you know if you're being inspired by the spirit and how do you know if it's your own thoughts and desires and foibles, right? Right. And, as he asked that question to Elder Hunter, Elder Hunter said to him, you know it's the will of the Lord when you speak. You have been set apart and ordained as the stake president. Your voice is the word of the Lord. Period. Mm-hmm. He believed that. Whatever came into his mind was the word of the Lord. And he could do this and that. He could change this and that. And he felt completely confident because whatever came into his mind was inspiration. Well, I forget how many years he functioned as the state president. It wasn't too many years because it wasn't the full term because um, he started doing unusual things. He got into trouble. He ultimately ended up being excommunicated. Um, But again, it's this, this is, I don't know, it's a kind of spiritual arrogance that, that leads to dysfunction. Right. And I think it comes from the, the famous scripture in, I think it's Doctrine and Covenants section one, by the voice of, by my own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same, right? It is not the same. I'm telling you, it's not the same, period. But I, but I did quote the scripture. Oh, right? yes, you did. <laughs> okay, so that, that is susceptible to at least two interpretations, one of which, which is a general interpretation, is that God reveals his will to his servants, and his servants speak the will of God, right? Correct. But the other interpretation is the other way, that whatever his servants speak is therefore de facto the word of God. Right. So right. the voice of the servants becomes the voice of God simply because it is spoken by the voice of those designated as his servants. Right. And it and sounds I, like that was the message that your state president got. Absolutely. And honestly, I've rarely seen that go well. And so you had some experiences with him um, where that didn't go well. Absolutely. And then he ended up malfunctioning. He just ended, he ended up becoming an emperor instead of a minister of the Lord. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Leadership is happen. about ministry in the name of the Lord. He became a dictator and just started making bad decisions and then made decisions in his personal life that got him excommunicated. So, um, I, I, again, it's this problem of, of spiritual authoritarian leadership and assuming a divine prerogative that you just simply don't have, period. Yes.
And by the way, that just makes me think of one thought is that um, whenever the idea of leadership is being taught in the LDS church, at least my experience has been that there's one principle that comes out first and foremost. In order to be a good leader, you have to be a good what, Philip? This is in the LDS church. Oh, you've got to be a, a good follower. You've got to be yes. loyal. Absolutely. You have to loyal. be a good follower. And, you know, I always accepted that on its face as being true. But then I started thinking about it later on, you know, after I started being a little bit more objective about things and maybe using my own brain. And I thought, is that necessarily true? Or is that just something that's being taught in order to help people believe they're being good leaders by ensuring that they're being good followers to their leaders? Oh, I'm absolutely convinced the number one criteria for selection to upper leadership is absolute loyalty. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Whether, That's the whether one it thing coincides that, with your conscience or not. That is the one primary determining factor. I believe that too, because they cannot afford to have people called up into the 70 or God forbid the apostles and have them go wampaku. I'm sorry, that would be a Japanese word. Like crazy, right? <laughs> or going off the reservation well. or something like that. You know, <laughs> you've got to be in lockstep. And if you're not in lockstep, you've got to at least present to the public as though we're in lockstep. Oh, that's funny. Was there something about Elder Vaughn Featherstone? Yeah, I'll do this quick because it makes me so sad. I don't want to sit here and cry. But Elder Featherstone, I met on many occasions. He was the general authority that set me apart. Being a military chaplain isn't a calling in the church. It's a job, but you have to be endorsed by the church. And so um, they actually sent out a general authority to set you apart slash bless you. It's not a calling in the church. They just kind of do it to bless you as you go into this unique assignment of representing the church outside the church. Mm -hmm. So Von Featherstone was the one who uh, met with me and and provided that service to me as I became a military chaplain. And I just happened to run into him on a variety of different meetings and occasions, and I suddenly became aware of his healing philosophy. Elder Featherstone assumed a position that, and it is logical, and it is, um, I don't know what to say, kind of desirable in one way, but if you hold the power of God, if you hold the priesthood, and the priesthood has the power to heal, if you're called upon to heal somebody, you don't mealy mouth around, you don't qualify, you don't hesitate, you heal the person, right? Period. You heal them. And so every time he did a, uh, the, you know, the, a blessing or an ordinance of healing, he always pronounced that that person was going to be made well, made whole, and be completely healed. Which, again, I find problematic. It's an extreme position. It doesn't leave much open for inspiration. And truthfully, as I think many of us, most of us have experienced, and as you've done several podcasts on, most of the healings that take place don't turn out to be healings, correct? Right. And in fact, the custom is for priesthood uh, holders when they're giving blessings to give at least one, if not multiple outs during the course of the blessing for it not to work. Right. And he never did that. Okay. He never did that. So again, admirable, but it's fraught with problems. So in my own personal experience, um, this man that I dearly, dearly loved, uh, my CES boss and former state president who uh, went back to his position at BYU as a church history professor and then was conducting tours uh, for Latter-day Saints to Jerusalem in his early 50s, had, I, I don't, can't remember, it was a brain tumor or a brain aneurysm, but something went bad in his head and he had severe pain and they rushed him back to Utah and he was hospitalized. And when he was examined, the doctors told his family that he would probably die in within three days. Mm. Now, this is a beautiful, gorgeous, wonderful family. They had 10 children, exceptional children. And that family got together after this news, and they prayed together and cried together, and, and they all had a common sense, a common inspiration that, in fact, he was going to pass away and that the Lord was going to support and sustain them. And they were unified. Well, word got to Salt Lake, you know, kind of a prominent church member 
um, he needs one of the brethren to come down and minister to him. And it happened to be Elder Featherstone. And he went down there. He went to the hospital. Um, as the wife reported to me, he came into the room. He didn't take time to preassess. He didn't take time to sit down and see how the family was feeling, uh, to understand what their thoughts were, what they expected. He just went over to the bed, laid his hands on Jim's head, and promised him that he would be completely made well. He would be completely healed, that his life mission wasn't over, that he had many more things to do in the service of the Lord, and so on and so forth. And then out he went. <clears throat> Well, you can imagine the turmoil and the confusion that would, that would be caused among these 11 family members. Mm -hmm. And some of the family members believed in the blessing, and they were all hopeful that he was going to be healed, and they would have their father back, and half uh, it made no sense to them. And so the conflict and turmoil starts within the family, right? Yes. And so um, in three days, as the doctor predicted, Jim passed away. And uh -oh. it, it created doubt, fear, turmoil, chaos, confusion, faith in God, faith in the brethren, their own testimony. I mean, all of that now is thrown up in the air. And <clears throat> it, it's been some years since I've talked with members of the family, but my impression was that that caused several of those children to, to lose their faith in the church and to mm. leave the church. So, so. Um, this to me is one of the ugly experiences. You know what I'm saying? It's not just bad. It's ugly. Right. Because of the, the impact on, on what was and is wonderful people who give the church a good reputation. You know what I'm saying? Their lives are so exemplary. They are the, the good face, face of the church. And to damage them in this way, I just find outrageous. Yes. And of course, I'm sure that wasn't his intent. And yet, and yet... Unless he's got a 100% success track record, he's got to realize that he's wading into a minefield when he does that kind of thing. Or at least you like, think he would. I'd like to think if he was wise enough, had been wise enough, to just sit down with the family for five minutes and say, hey, tell me how you're feeling. Tell me what's going on. And they had shared with them their prayer to the Lord and their resolution of his passing. I would like to think he would have given a different blessing. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that would have been contrary to his normal practice. Right. Well, he's the general authority who gave the famous uh, general conference talk. I think it was back in 1975 or so, where he talks about an unnamed father, right, whose son was killed in some kind of, I don't know if it was a car accident, and this priesthood holding father because he was righteous and because he hadn't looked at pornography the night before or masturbated within the past week, was able to use his priesthood to bless his son that he would come back to life and that son opened his eyes. Do you remember that talk? Whoa, I don't. Yeah, he doesn't give the name of this father. But uh, yeah, that, that story, I actually did um, uh, a podcast in which I used that quote. But I remember, I didn't join the church until 1978. But I remember hearing that story a number of times. And so I thought when I was going back to find it, that it would be 1978 or 1979, right after I joined the church. And I was kind of surprised to find out that it would have actually was given like three years before I joined the church. But the power of that story was such that it got currency and remained alive for a number of years so that I would hear it after I joined the church. Wow. That's the same talk where he, he talks about your sins. Oh, it's called um, something, a purging some kind of purging um, uh, is the name of the talk, but he talks about all your sins are going to be up there on this scroll and on judgment day, it's just going to come scrolling down and everybody and their dog is going to be able to see all the sins that you committed. And it's going to be really uncomfortable for a lot of people. Do you remember that part? You know, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> but, but it's there, but, I promise. But but that kind of story leads us into my experience with Paul Dunn. Paul H. Dunn. So Elder Dunn was the advisor, general authority advisor to the military chaplain for chaplains for three years, which is well, that's how because I got to that's because of all the miracles that happened to him in World War II. <laughs> well, he, he, he uh, like Elder Hanks and Elder Packer and Elder Dunn, just had a, a soft spot in their heart for the military and the military chaplains. And so 
they just always supported us in very uh, meaningful ways. But I was surprised because I grew up as a young adult on Paul Dunn stories, right? Mm, me too. I mean, when I went to Young Adult Firesides, we played Paul Dunn cassette tapes. We listened to those stories over and over and over. I had they them. Were so inspiring and uplifting. I felt the spirit. Did you feel the spirit? Man, I, I was just blown away and uplifted and empowered and everything else. What surprised me when Elder Dunn started teaching us was he didn't tell those kinds of stories. Hmm. He was a man who thought deeply, carefully. He was a man of substance. He had studied religion um, almost professionally. I mean, he really got into Bible study, and, and uh, he, he had a tremendous amount of depth and knowledge in theological thinking and so forth. And he would share that with us. I mean, I was just amazed at that side of him. And, and so um, he – one day one of the chaplains asked him about the Adam-God – uh, issue, you know, issue, theory, doctrine, problem. So does that mean there's like a group of you and you're having a training session of some sort with Paul? Oh, yeah. the, listen, the, the, the military relations committee of the church really served the chaplains well. They brought us in every October for general conference. The two or three days before conference, they would have a special just chaplains conference just for us. And we would always have two, like two members of the 12 speak to us and several of the 70 and the top leaders and LDS leaders in certain fields of counseling and so forth to instruct us and train us. Mm -hmm. uh, the church was absolutely fabulous in supporting the chaplains. And, and so, you know, this was during one of those two day, all day conferences before general conference. Mm -hmm. And one of the, you know, do you have any questions? And one of the chaplains said, well, sir, I'm a little troubled by this Adam God business, you know? And, Elder Dunn said, well, number one, and you're going to get a kick out of this. He said, let's be honest. Let's just admit that Brigham Young taught this. Okay. Wow. Let's not hide it. Let's not pretend he didn't teach it. Let's not sweep it under the rug. Let's just state up front. He taught it. Okay. And everybody was like, whoa. So then he said, now let's take the next step. What does it mean? Right. Mm hmm and he went on to explain that, look, his, his explanation was, you know, the church is isolated out here in Utah territory. Um, church leaders are speaking. They're not speaking all over the world in a general conference. It's not being published all over the United States. They're no, speaking. so they can say what they really think. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're speaking to really the, just the Latter-day Saints. And it was his opinion that it was a time of, of speculative theology, that the yes. brethren were experimenting and thinking and sharing and creating ideas. And, and to him, it was an exciting time. It was an interesting time. And that there's nothing wrong with that kind of, of uh, struggle to stretch your minds theologically. The problem is, is when some of those teachings start to interface with the world around us and it doesn't interface in a positive way, right? So in other words, we don't want to talk about the things that um, Brigham Young mentioned because other people will think it sounds crazy. Absolutely. Got it. And, and so – it was so refreshing to have a general authority not cover up the Adam God theory, right. be honest about it, and then try to deal with it in a context that made it somewhat digestible. I, st I still think it has serious problems that can't be resolved, but at least he made a, a an honest, valiant attempt to put it in a context that was digestible. Yeah, and I, I will also add, first off, giving him credit for that, but also add that it is apparent to me from that comment that he actually did – study because you yes. actually have to study it and go to those sources and have an open enough mind to recognize that he actually did teach this stuff and that all the apologetics and the spin that the church has put on it throughout the years really don't hold up. I'm telling you, he was well studied, thoughtful, substantive. That that just stunned me because he's known for telling these, you know, wild and crazy miracle stories. So, you know, when all the dust settled on that, you know, several lessons came to my mind. Number one, good people motivated by 
the needs of church culture can do some shady things, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the question comes to my mind, does church culture encourage honesty or this sort of, uh, you know, distortion of sensational stories and so forth? I think Paul Dunn got caught up in that. And there's just this bad history of sensationalism to create faith, true or not. Yeah, and you know, I and you asked the question, and I know you are sort of rhetorical, but I'll try and answer it. When you said, does the church culture encourage honesty or dishonesty? I think that church culture encourages loyalty and conformity and a promotion of the church as an entity. And whether it's honesty or dishonesty that is required in order to fulfill those goals of loyalty and promotion of the church, you know, it's six of one half dozen of the other. It's very pragmatic. Whatever will promote the church as an entity and as a divine institution and promote the loyalty of the members is what's important, not whether something is true or not true. Correct. And again, that has a dark side to it. Mm -hmm. and a price is paid later. I, I assess Kerman Mormon spirituality to be lifeless and boring. When I joined the church, and I think you felt the same way, when I joined the church, there was a vibrancy. There was an aliveness. There was an excitement. There was a passion. I, I don't see that anymore. I, I don't see that in my ward meetings or classes and so forth. It's gone. And I think what fueled that in our early days in the church was, was, you know, this kind of Paul Dunn culture. There were so many, mm -hmm. there were so, it was fueled by sensational miracle stories that just excited people and caused them to believe that all these things, even though they weren't <laughs> happening in their lives, were happening throughout the church in dramatic ways. And of course, what's happened is those have been exposed. And now, you know, with all this podcasting and stuff, the brethren can't tell, <laughs> they can't tell a story without it being analyzed and scrutinized. And so then the number of these stories, they're just not around anymore to fuel that kind of passionate spirituality. So we've ended up with what I consider to be kind of a lifelessness, spiritual lifeness in the church. And our spirituality, spirituality now, as far as I'm concerned, is kind of a sappy emotionalism. Yes, so, if the church isn't dead, it's on life support. Oh, spiritually speaking, as, as, as far as spiritual vitality and life. And I know that much of this is fueled by the perception that in Jesus' ministry, there were all these wild, sensational stories. I don't want to say that Jesus never performed a miracle. I would never say that. But it's my position that the miracle stories about Jesus are primarily externalized stories about inner spiritual development, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. The healing of blindness is the healing is the awakening of spiritual sight within. Do you see? Mm -hmm. The same with wholeness and well-being and so forth. Those those miracle stories are about they're, they're external indications of what should be happening in vibrant inner spiritual life. So uh, we focused on the external. The external has been taken from us, and we don't have the internal spiritual life, and so we end up with what I call sappy emotionalism. Yes. And I think one of the spiritual lessons that we learned from one of elder Paul H. Dunn's world war II stories is that if you're going to tell a story about a young American soldier who dies in your arms in a <coughs> foxhole on Iwo Jima, you should make sure that that same soldier isn't still alive to say that it's not true. Man, and it I didn't know. happen. I know. Holy cow. <laughs> uh, okay, well, listen, I don't, I, I, our time is getting somewhat short, so I'm going to press on if that's okay. Marion D. Hanks. I love Elder Hanks. Um, I do too. I got a story to tell you about Elder Hanks, okay? So oh, I know you're going to tell a much better story, but this was on my mission. He came to the mission in Japan to speak to the gathered missionaries at the mission home. We had a little chapel there. Anyway, so he's going to be speaking. I'm there. Everybody's hubbubbing before the meeting, and it's about to start, and I got to go to the bathroom. So I rush into the bathroom there off the chapel. I go to the bathroom, wash my hands real fast because this meeting's about to start. I think we're late, and I have to get back in there. And um, I don't even dry my hands, I don't think. I'm in such a hurry. I open the door to the restroom to head out to the chapel, and who should I run into right at the doorway but Marion D. Hanks. Oh. And I'm so shocked, and he's shocked, and I 
not thinking, I stick my sopping wet hand out <laughs> to him and he grabs my hand. So from his point of view, here's this missionary coming out of the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> with a wet hand. <laughs> it's just dripping. And you should have seen the look on his face. Anyway, that's my that's my Marion D. Hanks story. You go ahead with yours. Oh, uh, well, he was another one of our advisors for three years to the military chaplains. And and he took a special interest in my wife, Kim. Now, my wife's challenge in life has been health problems. For whatever reason, she's she's just had a long history of chronic health problems that have created a lot of suffering for her. Mm. And he brought us into his office one day and he, he ministered her in the most Christ-like way. Um, My heart was just so deeply touched and he gave her the most interesting, amazing blessing I have ever seen. It followed no priesthood blessing formula ever that I have seen. He put his hands on her head and he blessed, he laughed, he, he quoted scripture, he recited poems, he gave personal counsel. I mean, when this blessing, it, was, it went on forever. And when this blessing was over, it was like he had ministered to her from every conceivable point of view. Um, uh, it, it was just amazing. And then when it was over, she was sharing with him um, something that she had always wanted to to do in the temple. And my wife asked me not to share specifically what it was. Well, I mean, the hokey pokey? No, it was was something something she wanted to have done that was kind of contrary to church policy. So I don't want to get Elder Hanks in trouble. Okay. So Um, maybe, so maybe what we're talking about without specifics is maybe a change being made in maybe the endowment. No, no. um, It was something very personal for her that she, that she could participate in that, that um, was technically uh, against temple policy. Okay. In any case, after we had gone through this great blessing and we had this just amazing experience with him um, and she really shared this with him, not to have him do anything, but just as a part of a a heart's longing, he stood up, he said, let's go. And he grabbed us arm in arm and he walked us across the street to the Salt Lake temple, walked us in and made that happen for her. I mean, it was just, Unbelievable. So I love Elder Hanks, Christ-like heart, Christ-like ministry. Now, on another meeting with him, why he would trust me, I don't know. He, can, I, can I go back to this thing that we're sure. not talking about specifically with your wife yeah. in the temple? Uh, I think that's great. I think it's wonderful. Thumbs up, two thumbs way up for Elder Marion D. Hanks. But it occurs to me, that is this maybe another example yes. of like you getting married in the temple within five months instead of having to wait for a year? Yes. Because whatever was done to tweak uh, what happened in the temple for your wife, I mean, that was just for her. It didn't happen for anybody else, right? Correct. And he tweaked something for her in this instance. So okay. Okay. Um, in the context, I'm telling you, it was just, it was out of love and it was complete inspiration and, um, uh, that, that's the best way I can describe it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, later, later in con- I don't, I would, I say in confidence, he didn't ask for any confidentiality. He's not he, with us anymore, is he? No. And I, I'll, by the way, I have to tell you this. Uh, I don't know if many people know this, but Elder Hanks got Alzheimer's. No. And had to be put in a nursing home and did. Mm. Uh, deteriorated and passed away from that. <clears throat> Can I tell you something? Uh, it just occurs to me that's the downside of the word of wisdom. What's that? We have all these people living so long that they end up uh, oh. with dementia and Alzheimer's. Not all of them. <laughs> right. But you know what I mean? That's the downside. Yeah. This is the dark side of the word of wisdom, I'm telling oh, you right gosh. now. Go ahead with your story. I'm sorry. Well, anyway, I was serving as a hospice chaplain at the time. So I'm visiting hospice patients in nursing homes. And lo and behold, I'm in a nursing home, and who do I run across? Elder Hanks. Yeah. And I went into his room, and I sat down, and I was a bit sad because, you know, he just was not mentally there. 
And I sat with him on the bed. We held hands. And I said, Elder Hanks, uh, I, I love you. You have blessed my life and you've blessed my wife. And he said, really? And I, he said, can you tell me about it? And I said, absolutely. So I started sharing these stories of the things he had done with us. And I'm not exaggerating. I shared and I shared and I shared. And suddenly his mind caught a glimmer of that experience. There was light in his eyes. He had some, not full, but he had some memory of that experience with us. Mm -hmm. And he paused for a second and he said, oh, I'm so glad. And then we just sat there in silence and he kind of slipped back into it. And I used to visit him. I'd, whenever I was in that area, I'd slip in, I'd sit, hold his hand, tell him how much I cared for him, tell him how much he was a blessing to me and my wife. And, and um, you know, being ministered to by Marion Hanks and being able to subsequently minister to him, one of the highlights of, of spiritual living in my life. You're a good friend, aren't you? Well, he, he, he pulled that out of me. He, he was exceptional. Now, he, he shared two things. He had, he had some pet peeves. He shared two of them with me. One was he absolutely did not like the policy of the church that if a bishop um, had a moral discretion, committed adultery or something, or had an affair, it was the is policy. That, that, is that an indiscretion? That, what did I say? A moral discretion. No, indiscretion. <laughs> I thought that's what you meant. <laughs> indiscretion. Um, it was the policy of the church that that person could never, ever serve as a bishop again. Oh, okay. He absolutely hated that. And he said to me with such power, he said to me, do we in this church – do we believe fully and completely in repentance or do we not? The answer is not, by the way, but go ahead with your story. And then he said, <laughs> he said, if they had had that policy in Book of Mormon times, Alma the Younger would have never been the church president, right? Right. So that was one thing that really um, bugged him. He, he, he believed and wanted the church to practice full repentance. Can I mention, I'm sorry, because I know you have a second part to the story, but this makes me think, I think it was Brent Metcalf um, who was talking about, you know, Brent Metcalf, he's a very uh, famous I do. I do. LDS scholar. Uh, he's not a member of the church anymore, I think. I believe he was excommunicated, and that's what the story involves. And I believe I remember him talking about the procedure and the disciplinary council where he was excommunicated. And then his state president came up to him and in an attempted loving way said, you know, Hopefully, you'll come back one day and you'll be like um, Alma or one of the sons of Messiah, right? Oh Going my. from wickedness to righteousness. And if I'm recalling the, co the story correctly, Brent Metcalf looked the state president in the eye and said, yeah, there's one difference between me and them. And the state president says, what? And Brent Metcalf says, they weren't excommunicated from the church. Oh, that's right. I remember that. Yeah. Very powerful. Yeah. Wow. Okay, wow. your second story about Marion D. Hanks. Well, he was telling me about, <clears throat> excuse me, he somehow, and I don't understand all the details of it, but there was this area in China or Taiwan that he had become aware of, and he felt that through church missionaries, specifically sisters in this case, that this community could be served in Christ-like service. And he wanted Mormons to do it, and he wanted female Mormon missionaries to do it. And so he made a proposal to the 12 to have this mission funded where he could send these female missionaries into this area. Mm -hmm. And so as he was, he was proposing this, a member of the 12 said to him, well, look, uh, how many baptisms do you expect to get out of this? And his response was, it's not about baptisms. And then he quoted the verse from Matthew 25, you know, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Goats and sheep. He said, this is pure Christ-like service. Now, to my memory, that, was, that mission was not approved uh, because there was no perceived benefit in other words, Christ-like service isn't perceived benefit 
number of baptisms is. And of course, that proved to be quite disturbing to him also. Right. And this gets to one of the, the fundamental issues with Mormonism, as I have experienced it, which is that anything that we do that is service, we talk about service all the time, but anything that we do as service for somebody who's not a member of the church always comes with the ulterior motive of getting them to join the church. In other words, we don't do service for service's sake. We don't do charity for charity's sake. We always do it to get people to join the church. And frequently what ends up happening, and it's happened with me, I'm ashamed to say, I think it's happened with other people, is that you extend some kind of a um, overture of friendship, relationship to somebody, and then you throw the church on them, you invite them to talk to the missionaries, and then they say, no, I'm not really interested. And then you go away. And then you drop the relationship. I know. Because it was never about them. It was never about service. It was always about conversion. And believe me, not only have I recognized that in my life and seen it in other places, and apparently Elder Mary and D. Hanks did too with this story, but the people on the other end of that, they get the message in spades. Yeah, I, I see many examples of Christ-like service at the ground level, at the ward level, but at the general church level, the concern does seem to be much more for church growth an image more than than Christ-like service. So that was one of the lessons that came out of this. Of course, the other lesson is the church has had some truly, truly Christ-like leaders, period. You know what I'm saying? Yes, they do. And I saw that in Elder Hanks. Um, I'm going to try to speed a little bit here. Um, no, and I keep getting in the way, but this whole thing about baptisms, right? How many baptisms will it get? It? That's from the top, right? Oh, gosh. And that's why the mission presidents, even up to today, I'm hearing, and in your mission, it's yep. always about the number of baptisms. That's what the important thing is, because in this church, it seems that everything is measured by numbers. Success is measured by numbers, and whether that's number of baptisms or number of dollars in the bank or number of wards or number of stakes, um, it's always about the numbers. And charity doing good to your neighbor, being a good person and helping somebody out in need, that kind of stuff cannot be measured or put on a profit and loss statement. So therefore, it's not important, it seems, to the leaders of the church, at least not in the way that I see baptisms and church membership being important. Right. At the top, I don't see it as important. In my ward, I see it happening. So Yes. Yeah. Um, real quick on Elder Marlon Jensen, he also was a advisor to the chaplains for three years, so I got to know him. And again, a humble person responsive to the needs and requests of individuals. He spent countless hours ministering to individuals, listening to individuals, caring for individuals, which sometimes is difficult for the brethren when they have so many corporate responsibilities. And um, I had some disagreements with chaplain policy, and I found in certain instances the strict adherence to chaplain policies really hurt my military ministry to non-Mormons. So I had a meeting with Elder Jensen about this. I explained the situation. He listened very, very carefully, and then he said to me, uh, Chaplain McLemore, uh, I agree with you. I think you're considering things not only thoughtfully, but in an inspired way. And he said, I give you permission. I give you my blessing to continue in the way you are doing this without saying, even though it's contrary to policy. So that was a tremendous blessing in the way I was able to serve others who were outside, outside the church. And then later, um, one evening, I went with Elder Jensen to a Unitarian church in Ogden, Utah. And this small Unitarian church had made a request to church headquarters. They wanted to have an interface, a face-to-face -face with a general authority. Um, Elder Jensen, if I remember, I lived out in Huntsville. And after a full day of work, driving home, and he had a long drive home, um, we went to this Unitarian Church. Are you there? I'm right here. Oh, I'm sorry. It's got okay. Silent. We went to this Unitarian Church with another friend of ours, 
And he spent a long, long evening, hours and hours, answering questions, hostile questions, criticisms from Unitarians, almost disrespectful sometimes, to Elder Jensen. I'm telling you, he was composed, kind, caring, firm on principle, um, really, really impressive. And then when I looked at him physically, I realized he was doing this under tremendous exhaustion. And he had to get up early and go back to church headquarters the next day. Mm -hmm. So here was a man that, that uh, again, served in the church, out of the church, served individuals on top of his corporate duties and responded to virtually every request that came his way and often did it at the point of personal exhaustion. So Elder Jensen's uh, always been a hero to me. Can I say that I've heard a number of really, really wonderful stories about Elder Jensen, but I do have to say that hearing your story about how he addressed the Unitarians with their questions, a part of me wishes that he had done the same kind of job when he went to Sweden. Oh, with, I know. As with uh, Elder Turley, Richard Turley from the, the church historian's office. Um, to, it was like 2011, I think it was, to do the Swedish rescue. Because there, I don't think he came across in the same way. And in fact, they took about the first half hour not answering questions, but explaining that anybody with doubts was in Satan's power. Well, again... You know, I had two lessons from Elder Jensen. Number one, he's another one of those truly Christ-like leaders. Number two, these church history issues are so painful and they are so fraught with danger to the testimonies of members that the leaders just absolutely feel that they have to tread lightly, lightly, lightly to prevent damage. And he obviously, in several situations... Uh, was not fully honest and not fully transparent because he, you know, he didn't want to unnecessarily crush hearts, so to speak, which raises a different question. Why do mm. we have issues that crush hearts if this is the church of Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. And when you say tread lightly, I hear whitewash and obfuscate. I understand. I understand. But you have to tread lightly in a minefield. Otherwise, you're going to lose a leg. <laughs> That's right. And you know, other people are going to lose their legs. And if you care for people, you don't want them to be hurt. There was somebody who once said this really funny saying, which I co-opted, which is that uh, church history, um, no, it says you, can't, you cannot walk more than a few steps into the minefield of church history without losing a limb. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Are you ready for Elder Hugh Pinnock? Listen, uh, this will take a little time. I don't want to blow the rest of our time, but let me get going here. Um, Elder Pinnock was one of the, we were living in Alaska. He was one of those uh, visit, the, you know, interview the chaplain if you're in the stake. Uh, they're, they're planned to be 15 minute scripted interviews. And so, and they, he meets with the chaplain and the wife. So this was, he was up for state conference. This was after the Saturday evening conference. As you know, general authorities, when they come to state conferences, the state president sets up a number of interviews with state members where there are unusual problems, unusual situations that only a general authority can handle. Hmm. So when we went into this Saturday evening interview after a state conference, there were four or five couples or individuals sitting in the, uh, the state president's waiting area to meet with Elder Pinnock after he had met with us. And he took us first. And again, it's programmed to be a 15 minute interview. So he went through the 15 minutes. And then all of a sudden, he just starts talking to us and asking questions and sharing stories about fishing and his grandfather. And, you know, we're, we're just like super confused. And so we kind of dive in and start sharing, you know, stories about our lives and, you know, it's 15 minutes, it's 30 minutes, it's 40 minutes, it's 45 minutes, it's heading on to an hour. I can see the stake president's feet walking back and forth under the door. He's <laughs> sweating bullets because he's got all these people and Elder Pennington just needs to get to bed and he has to come back and speak at state conference in the morning. And then he has a flight soon after state conference, right? He's on a tight schedule. Yeah. So, anyway, um, 
he's sweating, we're sweating, we don't know what's going on. He realizes he's aware of the stakes present, it's nervous energy. So he finally stops and he says, he said, uh, boy, this has been so much fun. I've just enjoyed visiting with you folks. And we're like, well, yeah, we're great. grateful you took the time. And he says, oh, I'd like to speak with you again. Could you come back tomorrow? Oh. And we know he's got a flight soon after state conference. Can you come back tomorrow and meet with me after the general session? And we're like, you know, at first we're like, sure. And then I stopped and said, oh, wait a minute. I said, you know, I, I have a Sunday morning service at the base chapel. I can't be here. And he said, well, it's not you I wanted to talk with anyway. It's her. And he pointed to Kim and he asked Kim if she could come back. And she said, yes. So we left and I thought, I'm not missing this, you know. So I called one of my brother. <laughs> I called one of my brother chaplains and I said, Look, can you take my service tomorrow? I've got an emergency. And he said, Sure. So, yes, historically speaking, in the LDS church, there are some general general authorities you don't want to leave your wife alone with. <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> Bad RFM. I'm Bad sure RFM. that's not Elder <laughs> <Duke> Pinnock, though. <laughs> so anyway, now here's the backstory. My wife has uh, chronic health problems, yeah. and um, her physical capacity, although she's strong as an ox, can, is limited at times. And she had been called to be the early morning seminary teacher uh, in our ward, and she did a fabulous job. Now, our ward is a 20-minute drive away from our house, so for her to get up at 5 and to drive to, the, you know, get over to the chapel and teach a seminary lesson at the chapel and then come back, it was just too much for her. So I actually reconstructed our basement and made a constructed a seminary room so the kids would come directly to our house so Kim could just get up and go downstairs and teach the class. And she did a, a fabulous job. I mean, kids went on missions and loved the gospel due to her teaching and so forth. She was absolutely so fabulous that the bishop was just so excited she would be teaching seminary the next year. Well, I'm in a state of panic because it took a tremendous energetic toll on her and her health was degraded. And so I asked her to pray about whether she should teach seminary the next year or not. And she did in private prayer. And she came to me, she said, the Lord told me very clearly, um, I'm not supposed to teach seminary next year. I'll have to let the bishop know. And so she went over to meet with the bishop that week and on her way over she began some internal bargaining and then when she got with the bishop uh you know they got her right back into the seminary thing uh teaching seminary he, he did not want to lose her because she was so good and she came back home and said guess what it, you know i'm going to teach seminary anyway and i think i'll be blessed in my health and so forth mm. And I said, oh, Kim, I, I thought your answer was the right one. You know, don't let the bishop. No, oh, when the bishop, you know, I think this is. So that's the backstory, right? Right. So now interview one with Elder Pinnock. Now interview two with Elder Pinnock after the general session, and he's got an airplane to catch. Yeah. All right. So here we go. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, hunting stories, grandfather stories, <laughs> grandmother stories. <laughs> Right. He is sweating. I mean, he's just visibly now tense and stressed, but he just keeps talking friendly and sharing. Now, Elder Pinnock looks stressed and sweating. I mean, it's, he's got an airplane. He's got to catch a plane or his whole schedule gets fouled up, right? Right. But you think he's in charge of the meeting. Why doesn't he just stop and say goodbye and leave? Because he knows there's something he is supposed he, later he said to me, okay. I knew there was something I had to address. I just didn't know what it was. Really? And all of that conversation was to try to get this thing to pop up so he could take care of it. He just didn't know what it was. He had the very clear inspiration that he was supposed to minister to my wife in some way. He just couldn't figure out what it was. Hmm. So he just kept, you know. He just kept conversation going, praying this would come up. And so he was just exasperated. So after 45 minutes and almost missing his plane, he finally says, Sister McLemore, tell me again what you're going to be doing this year. She proudly reported, oh, I'm going to be teaching early morning seminary. He wiped his brow. I mean, you could see in his mind, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> he stood up, put his 
hand firmly on the table and he said, no, you are not. You are not teaching seminary this year. Let me tell you what you're going to do this year. You're going to do nothing at church. You're going to accept no callings whatsoever. You're going to sleep. You're going to eat well. You're going to exercise. You're going to rest, 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 and you're going to recover your health so you can be of service to the Lord in the future, period. She says, I can't do anything. He said, well, if you want to do a little bit of visiting teaching, maybe. That's it. <laughs> and it was unbelievable. So, you know, I said, well, sir, the bishop really is, you know, kind of set on her. And he said, I'll take care of the bishop. <laughs> so, you know, next Sunday I saw the bishop down the hallway and I started running toward him to let him know. All he did was hang his head and raise his hand, which meant, I got the call. <laughs> yeah, I surrender. Now, Elder Pinnock, it was, I mean, anyway, for me, this was such an amazing extension of himself under a fair amount of pressure yeah. to minister to my wife, an individual, right? Mm -hmm. Now, he made the fatal mistake when he was walking out of the room. If you're ever in Salt Lake, come visit. Well, as it turns out. Seriously. Well, he might have meant it seriously since he enjoyed you so much. Could be, but I don't, I'm not letting that pass. Right. So over many years, I had been collecting a list of, that was titled questions for general authorities, right? Yes. I had a list of 10 questions that I wanted to sit down and go over with a general authority. So <clears throat> next time I was in Salt Lake City, I called Elder Pennick's secretary. Hello, this is, you know, Chaplain McLemore, blah, blah, blah. Elder Pennick said to come see him. She said, sure, come on over at three. He's got an hour. So I went over and sat down in Elder Pinnock's office at three. And I started my list. I said, sir, I have a list of questions for a general authority. Would you be willing to go after these? And he said, oh, sure, let's do it. My number one question. In, in 1981 or 82, there was a message of the first presidency in the Enzyme. It was the famous story about Elder uh, Marion G. Romney's father sending him off on a mission. Yes. And in that story, they were standing on a train uh, deck. I don't know what you call those things. The platform. Platform. Excuse me, platform. I was drinking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you what. Okay. That but. explains a lot. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and he's sending his son, you know, future Elder Marion G. Romney off on his mission. And he says to him, quote, Marion, I would rather you come home in a coffin then come home unchaste. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have heard that story a number of times. So now this is a message of the first presidency in the church magazine. And Mary and G. Romney was a member of the church of the first presidency at the time. Yes. That's a powerful message in a powerful place. I'm now teaching institute and supervising seminary, right? Yes. At the University of Georgia at this time. So I'm doing training for seminary teachers throughout Georgia and South Carolina. And this message is forefront. And I'm saying to the seminary teachers, listen, I don't think this is a wise thing to be teaching our youth, right? Right. We don't want some young man to go off on a mission, get himself in trouble, and then feel like he's got to kill himself rather than repent and come home. Right. right? Whose son? What, what, what? You want your son to go on a mission, come home dead in a coffin? Right. And, and I know. And the thing is, I think that we recognize that this is a story that's being told in such a way as to emphasize the importance of chastity, right, for a missionary, and that it's so important and uh, but honestly, if you were to go behind that, I don't think even Elder Marion G. Romney's dad, if you actually pinned him down, would actually say, yeah, if your son goes out and accidentally falls or whatever happens, you know, uh, has sex on his mission, that you would literally rather he come home in a coffin. I agree. And this is my feeling. My feeling is I, I don't doubt that, that Elder Romney's father was giving him for him maybe inspired counsel, that that counsel somehow protected him, right? But inspired counsel for one person doesn't mean a general message for every person. 
Right. And by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but this reminds me of what Elder Marion D. Hanks told you, which is, do we or do we not in this church believe in repentance? Absolutely. And this Absolutely. story says, no, no, we don't. No. So I tried to tell the seminary teachers, I tried to instruct them not to share this story or use it in any of the seminary classes. And you know what the response was? What? Who are you? Who do you think you are? You're just a young, sniveling little seminary supervisor. This is a message of the first presidency. Get over yourself. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I got back, okay? Not surprising. All right. <clears throat> so top of the list is what? Uh, Elder Pinnock, there was this message from the first presidency in 1980, whatever it was, and it's a story about President Romney. I didn't get that far. That's as far as I got in the story. Elder Pinnock raised his hand to get me to stop talking. He said, Chaplain McLemore, that was a mistake. And he said, you know whose mistake that was? And I said, no, sir. He said, it was my mistake. I said, I don't understand. He said, I was the managing director of the enzyme at that time. It was my responsibility, right, to approve the items in the enzyme and to sign off of them, including the message of the first presidency. He said, I had had a busy week. I just glanced over it. I really didn't do my due diligence. If I had seen it, that story would have never been included as a message of the first presidency. He said it was absolutely my fault. And he said, you are absolutely right. That should not be taught to the youth of the church. So I, I was so relieved and affirmed. I, I don't know how to tell you. I mean, it affirmed to me that, wow, my spiritual discernment's not so bad, right? If right. I'm willing to take a stand against the message of the first, first presidency and then later be affirmed that it was the correct position, it sent the message to me, trust your soul, right? Mm -hmm. Trust your inner core. So I was so grateful for, for that experience. Now, it brought up a lot of questions. Yeah, it's bringing up a lot of questions in my mind. Can I share mine with you? Sure. First thing is this. Why is it that if it's a mistake and he knows it's a mistake enough to raise up his hand before you've even finished the question, that nothing is done to remedy the mistake and correct it and retract it so it doesn't get taught to members of the church, which is supposed to be taught to every single member of the church if it's a message of the first presidency? That's the first thing. Well, it creates an image problem, obviously, and how could a first presidency message be wrong and who puts the first presidency messages in there, right? I mean... Well, they're authored ostensibly by a member of the first presidency, which is why they're called the first presidency message. Right. Now, in that case, and I don't know, I got the impression this might be true in other cases, you know, maybe the first president is so busy, they don't have time to do their message. And a staff writer at the Enzyme goes through their sermons and messages and picks one out and the, the general authority managing director approves it. And that's how it gets in there, right? I have no idea how things work on such a rarefied level, but... I will also say that Marion G. Romney, of course, this story does, doesn't just appear in this first presidency message. If my memory is correct, and sometimes it is, this was given by Marion G. Romney in 1960 or 1961 in general conference when he originally told this story. Uh, so it's in general conference already. Yeah, that's it as powerful as the magazine. Yeah, if not more so, right? And the second thing that occurs to me is, you know, people are saying to you, who do you think you are to challenge the first presidency message? Well, who is Elder Hugh Pinnock? Who is he to be challenging what a member of the first presidency has said? He's further up the totem pole than you are, but he's not at the top. See, I, that's why I don't believe that Elder Romney intentionally put that in there, because I don't think he would have felt that he had the prerogative <clears throat> to not print it if that were the case i think he felt he had the prerogative because that elder pinnock it, did yeah elder pinnock had the prerogative okay i think he I, if elder romney had submitted that himself in person i i don't think he i i think if he wanted to dispute it he would have had to have gone back in this case there was no indication in this case the indication was he could have can't he could have uh deep sixed it on his own okay and, that, and then, there's this other thing i'm so sorry 
But there's this other aspect that comes out, right? Which is um, the propensity of lower level leaders in the church to take the bullet for the higher ups. Okay. And all I mean is he's sitting there saying, it's my fault. Well, no, it's not his fault because Marion D. Romney, that's his story, right? And he told it in general conference. So it's not like it's um, Elder Pinnock's fault that he told it. You see what I'm saying? But he's taken the bullet for him in order that the blame not be transferred where it belongs, if blame there be, to Marion G. Romney. And the reason this comes up to me is because the same thing happened during the Swedish rescue. When Richard Turley is up there and he's trying to uh, exonerate the leaders of the church for having 100 years of pictures of Joseph Smith translating the Book of Mormon without a stone in a hat, right? Right. And basically um, giving an incorrect, I'm trying to use the, the most delicate language I can, an incorrect impression and teaching what is not correct about the way that the uh, Book of Mormon was translated and other church history issues where church leaders have mischaracterized what happened in order to promote the dominant narrative, if you know what I mean. But in this context, uh, Richard Turley is up there in front of an increasingly angry crowd of Swedes. And what he says is, look, this is up to the church historians, right? And just because we're doing the best we can, but if church historians make a mistake and get something wrong, don't blame the prophet. Well, they do have that buffer. There's no question about that. Yeah, and even the even the middle level people like Richard Turley, and in this case, I'm sensing Hugh Pinnock, are see see part of their role as taking the bullet for the leaders of the church. Yeah, well, I, I can I can understand that point of view. I, I I can just tell you that in the context, um. He seemed to feel bad that he let that slip through. And I did come up with the interpretation that, that he felt he could do it because it hadn't been submitted directly. Okay. Very good. Um, uh, the, the, so out of the nine things that I went through, that was the top of the list. He agreed with me and affirmed that my perspective and position was absolutely correct. Mm-hmm. Except for the last item. And the last item was this practice I began to be seeing in stakes where, and I sat on high councils for 14 years, this practice of when you excommunicate a member, one of the curses of excommunication is you can no longer pay tithing nor have the blessings of tithing, correct? Right. What I began seeing was... That's the worst part about being excommunicated, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) There's nothing worse than that. Honey, we can go to dinner tonight. I don't have to pay tithing anymore. (laughs) It's such a curse. What was happening is after the person was excommunicated, after the person was formally instructed that they could no longer pay tithing and no longer receive the benefits and blessings of tithing, after the whole thing was over, I saw stake presidents going up to individuals and saying to them, look, um, why don't you – Pay, take the money that you would uh, pay for tithing and maybe pay it through your wife, pay it through her name. Or why don't you put it in a savings account and then pay it later when you're rebaptized? Or why don't you pay it maybe through a child, you know, some scheme mm-hmm. for the person to pay the tithing, but it not being in their name. Okay. Right. So they're not cursed so bad after all. Right. Not, you don't get the full curse. <laughs> well, I saw this so many times. It was like, wait a minute, this is underhanded. Do we believe that not paying tithing um, is going to create a lack of blessing and that paying tithing really does give a blessing? And so, you know, you know, what's going on here? It's like, it, to me, it just seemed like a money grab. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And it's odd because there's not that many people being excommunicated. Why would you go that far around the block to – get money out of people when it's really a few number of people, but I, I can only come to the conclusion. They didn't want people to get out of the habit of it. And then, you know, either not want to come back or not want to pay or I, I don't know that elder Pinnock defended. He stood up and he said to me, the church is right on there. Well, once he said the church is right on there, I concluded this wasn't a local problem, right? This mm. wasn't a local issue, but somehow right. the, the state presence had been directed to give this kind of counsel after the formal, after the formal affair. So, you know, 90% of my experience with Elder Panic was super, super, super inspiring 
and positive. Um, and I came to the conclusion that, you know, again, there are really inspired leaders in the church, but two problems. Number one, they will not correct or apologize for mistakes that have or could harm people. And number two, the church is absolutely obsessed with money. Um, so, okay. Shall so I he, continue? But, but, he, but Elder Pinnock agreed with all of your questions or all of your concerns, except for that one. Except for that one. I was completely affirmed in everything else. I can't tell you the confidence it gave me in being able to judge um, inspired assessment or interpretation of, of principles and practices and policies and so forth. Well, obviously he was inspired because he agreed with you, right? <laughs> There's only I, one place where he wasn't inspired. I know. And it's obviously <laughs> a ridiculous, it's, I mean, it, and see, it's so obvious that that's an unethical practice, right? I, it is to me. Absolutely. So I was quite surprised. And I think he became a little suspicious at that point that maybe I was baiting him or something because the meeting ended and and uh, off I went, but. Well, can I, can I mention this? Um, Hugh Pinnock, I don't know that much about. The main thing I know about him is his role as being one of the three church leaders that were most closely involved with the Mark Hoffman documents. I, as I recall from reading um, the books about it, uh, there was uh, Hugh Pinnock, there was Dallin Oaks and there was Gordon Hinckley were the three people mainly involved in that. Do you know anything about that? Well, I actually asked him about that. That was one of the items that I was, was curious. It? Was this after 1985 or 86? This was, oh yeah, we were in Alaska. So it had to be um, like 91. Oh my gosh. Tell me about that. Well, it wasn't too much. I asked him about Mark Hoffman and he goes, oh, wasn't that a mess? And, you know, he met with, if I remember the story correctly, he met in a parking garage in Salt Lake City and passed $200,000 along to Mark Hoffman for one thing or another. <clears throat> and um, I think the, the first presidency was using different people, mission presidents and other people to, to channel donated or personal funds into this sort of thing. So, so some, you know, so exorbitant amounts of church funds didn't get, you know, wrapped up into that. So in any case, his, final reflection to me was that um, President Hinckley at some point, and I think it was over the McClellan papers, he wanted like $400,000 for the, McCle the reported McClellan papers, which he didn't have. Right. Often had debts all over the place. He needed cash quick. And so the McClellan papers was a, a serious threat to the image of the church. And he felt the church would be afraid enough to cough up 400000 And apparently at that point, as I understand it, President Hinckley decided this isn't smelling good. You know, this isn't feeling good. Uh, I'm not turning over $400,000. And so they didn't make the deal. And that put Hoffman in crisis. And then that's when he started, you know, bombing Look. people all over Salt Lake City. And yes. So what Elder Pinnock's message to me was, in the end, President Hinckley was inspired and that's what ended this fiasco, okay? Well, okay, I, I'm, that's nice, but gosh, why couldn't President Kimball be inspired and save the deaths of those people? You know what I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. And this is, by the way, after Gordon B. Hinckley had personally written a check out to Mark Hoffman in Gordon B. Hinckley's office, as I recall, not for the Salamander letter, I think that was later, and I don't know that the church bought that one, but for the treasure digging right. letter. And uh, then Gordon B. Hinckley stowed it away and hid it. And it didn't come to light till over a year later after Mark Hoffman leaked the existence of the church's possession of the letter because he knew because he sold it to him, right? Right. To the Los Angeles Times. Yeah. So I, I was grateful he shared that with me. My lingering, you know, distress is if the Lord's going to inspire the leaders to, you know, to alert them to this fraud, why not do it before people are killed? Yeah, before people yeah. get blown to smithereens for crying out loud. It reminds me of the old joke about why is something always in the last place that you look for it? Because after you find it, you stop looking. That's right. <laughs> so he was. So he. So the Lord finally inspired. 
Right. Right. That was his conclusion. And that seemed to satisfy him for some reason. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, all right. Uh, do we have a time problem? Uh, not too much yet, but I know that you want to tell the story about Elder Yoshiko Kikuchi. Oh yeah. Let me press on here and I'll try to move. Um, again, another one of these interviews, um, a general authority interviewing a chaplain and his wife. And <clears throat> the backstory here is um, my wife had been injured in an accident and seriously tore up her right, uh, maybe left shoulder, I forget, who cares, one of her shoulders. And <clears throat> she had had an arthrogram where they inject dye into the shoulder and of course the dye leaks out all over the place and there's been a tear and they have to surgically go in and repair that to restore the integrity of the shoulder capsule. So anyway, she was scheduled for the surgery the day after we met with Elder Kikuchi, which was, uh, uh, I believe, a Sunday evening in this case. And so we were telling him about the surgery. And out of the blue, he jumped up and he said, oh, can I give you a blessing? And well, sure. Gosh, we're not going to turn down a blessing. I want things to go well for Kim, you know. So he comes around the table. We had never had any experience with Elder uh, Kikuchi before. Um, and so I think I mentioned to you earlier, my, my son married a Japanese lady and lived in Japan for a number of years. And he had run across Elder Kikuchi a couple of times and his assessment of him was energy and passion. Mm -hmm. In any case, uh, this is exactly what happened. He laid his hands on Kim's head and I'm telling you, I thought we were transported into a Protestant revival meeting with one of these television healing preachers. He, I, I you know, I, I, it's, it's like the Steve Martin wild and crazy guy, you know, <laughs> he went for it. I mean, he went for it. He, it, it was yelling. It was screaming. It was power. It was passion. It was energy. He, he blessed her shoulder, her liver, her stomach, her legs, her head. I bless you and heal you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. He blessed and healed every cell in her body. I mean, I have never, ever experienced or heard anything like that. Um, and again, it was more reminiscent of, of, of wild, you know, evangelical Protestant tent healing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Absolutely spectacular and amazing. And so when that was over with, you know, we expressed our thanks and we went home. We went all the way home, it was like, what in the hell was that? You know, we were so grateful for his attention, but it was like, we have never experienced anything like this before the, with the priesthood leader, you know? So sometimes I think these foreign guy, guys bring a breath of fresh air into things. Um, in any case, uh, we went in for the surgery. It was supposed to be like three hours. And about 40 minutes later, the surgeon came out and said to me, um, your wife's done. I said, well, I, gosh, I thought that was going to take hours. And he said, you know, I got in there. And her, her shoulder capsule was just fine. There was no evidence of any tear whatsoever. He said, uh, I, I can't explain it. That's just what happened. So he explained what he did. He did a little clean up and tune up in there to make her shoulder move easier. But the purpose of the surgery couldn't be done because she was, quote, unquote, healed, right? Yeah. And um, which I found to be quite remarkable. Now, the blessing was this. Kim's father had a heart attack a couple of days later. She really needed to be there. It did look like he was going to die. Uh, you know, a trip from Alaska to Georgia is not a small thing. And and um, if, in fact, she had had that surgery, she would have been in one of these weirdo devices where your elbow is propped out for six weeks. She couldn't have flown on an airplane. So our conclusion when, was the need of Kim's family and Kim's just magical quality and faith was what resulted in that. So she could be home with her dad and minister her, to her family because she really is the spiritual heart of her family. So um, that turned out to be just a super duper amazing experience uh, with Elder Kikuchi and no downside whatsoever. Philip, is Kim going to listen to this podcast? Uh, she might. I'm a little afraid because she loves the church, doesn't like me to criticize. And then if I'm critical, I might 
be subject to a butt whooping from an angel, but uh, she might. I well, I want, I want you to tell her for me, okay, that that blessing and that healing from Elder Kikuchi was not about her dad and it wasn't about her family and it wasn't so she could be there for somebody else, okay? It was all about her because, dang it, she's good enough on her own. Oh, I agree. Oh, I agree completely. Um, no, this is part of this uh, this wonderfulness of her that I that I hear you talking about, which is that well, the blessing really wasn't for me. There was a great blessing, but it was so that I could help somebody else out. You know what I mean? Oh, I see what you're saying. It's that humility in her that I find so distasteful because <laughs> she's good enough on her own. Now, <laughs> you don't have to tell her that part. <laughs> so. Um, but here's the thing. Okay, I want to leave aside any potential questions about naturalistic explanations for this, oh, yeah. this yeah, healing, no. okay? I'm going to put that to the side. Yeah. And, because I'm sure you've run through those in your head too. Oh, yeah. But here's my question. If you take Elder Kikuchi's blessing to Kim and Elder um, Featherstone's blessing to your former state president that at, uh, at the hospital, right? They right. both sound like they were made in a similar kind of affirmative, this blessing's going to work and you're going to be healed kind of way. Elder True. Featherstone's blessing doesn't work, and Elder Kikuchi's blessing does. Had you ever thought how you would, have you ever compared those in your mind and thought how you might have felt if Elder Kikuchi's blessing had not worked? Oh. Well, I... <sighs> Or would you have you know, just chalked it up to nice try? We appreciate listen, your effort. In my, I, this is sad to say, but you know, I at that point I'd served in bishoprics and been on high councils and given blessings to countless number of people. I just knew from experience these things don't work ninety nine point nine percent of the time. We are okay. trained to not expect any kind of miraculous result, yeah. aren't we? So I that's why I say when he offered to bless her, I was grateful. I had no expectation there would be any consequence. I was just thankful for the ministry and the caring the fact that that did happen and and the blessing that resulted from that i was just you know just super humbled and grateful for it but yeah. i certainly didn't expect it right well yeah. it's, a wonderful it's part of my wife's it's part of my wife's magic uh uh listen when when you know my wife had been divorced and here she's getting ready to marry again. She's absolutely terrified, right? And she has three children. She's bringing a new man into the house. And how does she know that this is going to be an inspired mar uh, marriage and it's going to be good, you know? She went to her stake president. She said to him, I need a sign. I, I need a sign that the Lord <laughs> wants me to marry this Philip character. And the two of them sat together and concocted an actual date specific action specific sign that I would have to fulfill not knowing what the sign was to indicate that she was supposed to marry me. Okay. This is while they were reading the scripture in Matthew about a wicked and an adulterous generation, <laughs> right? Her state president said to her, well, we don't normally, we don't normally look for signs, but he said in your case, I think it would be justified. And so they concocted this sign, right? So what was the sign that you would wear yellow stockings and garters? Well, this is the problem. She lets it slip. <laughs> she, she let it slip that there's a sign. So I want to marry her. I love her. Now I'm under the burden of having to produce the sign or she's not going to marry me, right? Wait, she told you that there was a yes, sign? Yes. She told me there was a sign. She let it slip. So what am I doing? Every time I would come to date her, I've got clothes on backwards. I got the yellow socks on. I'm doing handstands. I'm, you know, doing the worm out in the front yard before I go in. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make this sign happen. I mean, it just tormented me for a week. What do I do? What's the sign? You know. So anyway, uh, I was due to visit her one weekend, and again, I'm having to drive from Auburn, Alabama, to Atlanta, Georgia, and something uh, came up in the seminary program I had to tend to, and I couldn't go that weekend. <clears throat> I had to go do some training somewhere. And so this I is, called. This is like the old Groucho Marx TV show, You Bet Your Life. <laughs> where say the secret word and a duck will fly down and give you $100. <laughs> so I call her on the phone. I said, Kim, I can't come this weekend. I'm sorry. I got this seminary problem. I'll, I'll come next week, you know? And she said, well, okay. So she got off the phone and, and, uh, 
she immediately got seriously depressed because the sign was that I would do something on that particular weekend. And now I'm not coming. So anyway, I uh, called to set up the, uh, the training I needed to do. I think it was a new seminary teacher at a distance. And, and then after I finished the call, uh, I was getting ready for bed and I sudden, I just had this, you know, this is going to sound the classic Mormon story. I just had this strong impression. Can, can the seminary teacher put her off for a week? Go keep your, your uh, visit with Kim. So I called the seminary well, you've teacher. you got to, don't you? I mean, there needs no ghost, my Lord, come from the grave to tell us this. She's already told you it's got to happen this weekend. If you're not there. Oh, she never told me that. Oh, she didn't tell you it was going to happen that weekend. No, I didn't. I had no idea what the sign was or what the time frame was. None was. Oh, okay. Okay. Just that there was a sign, but you didn't know it had to happen that week. No, I'd I'd been doing all this goofy stuff and had no clue about the sign or the time frame. Okay. Continue with your inspiration. And she didn't say anything when she just hung up the phone and got depressed and figured it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So... Um, anyway, I, I called her back and said, Hey, look, I postponed this seminary thing. I'm going to go ahead and come. I'll see you in a couple hours. It was two hour and 15 minute drive. So off I went. And as I was driving over there, yes. um, and you're not going to believe this. This is a good elder McConkey, um, counsel. I don't know if you remember an elder McConkey told people, give up this, the Lord inspiring you who to choose. I never expected the Lord to pick out my wife for me. I picked her out myself. You remember that? Oh yeah, absolutely. It was quoted most recently by Elder Oaks in a young adult face to face, but go ahead. So what happens? So I'm doing the typical Mormon there? inspiration thing. I want, I'm looking for a sign from the Lord to, you know, to, to pop the question. And as I'm driving over, I hear old McConkie's voice say, you make your choice. Don't blame it on the Lord. Right. Right. You be responsible. So I thought, damn it. I'm asking her to marry me. So I went over and picked her up and I said, let's go for a drive. And we drove over to this uh, little Catholic school at a grassy area. And I drove up into the circular driveway and I stopped the car and I said, Kim, I'm terrified. I don't know what this sign is, when it is, what it is. I don't want this sign to, you know, break us up in any way. Will you marry me? I'm just asking you, will you marry me? No sign or, you know, screw the sign. Will you marry me? And um, she paused. Her first response was when, which is, I thought was kind of funny. But then um, when she affirmed that she would, I said, now, what about this sign? What's this sign? And she said, well, the sign was that you would ask me to marry you this weekend. Oh, come on. That's the, easiest, that's the easiest sign in the world. <laughs> the sign should have been that you'll propose to me and you'll use my new name that I got in the temple when I went through the first time for my own endowment. That would have been a real good sign. By the way, I do have a new name story, but anyway. <laughs> no, um, I'm sorry. I don't mean to, I don't mean to rain uh, on your parade on this one. No, that, that's a wonderful story. It was amazing. I mean, so this is what I'm saying. She has this magical quality where these amazing things just kind of happen. And I, I'm sorry I got off track there, but. Um, That's okay. Make sure she doesn't listen to this podcast after all. Okay. <laughs> hey, listen, we were in Las Vegas. I was on the high council and um, Kim didn't want me to use this general authority's name. So I'll, I'll honor that. Uh, in any case, the General Authority 70 came into the stake, um, taught a very good Saturday evening session. And then the next morning, he had a special meeting with bishops and young women's, young men's and young women's presidents. And my wife was the young women's president in our ward at the time. And in this meeting, this special meeting, he instructed the bishops to teach to the young men and the young women a list of nine teachings, nine principles, and that they were to do it in secret. In other words, it was to be done without any parents being present, only the, uh, the bishop and the uh, young men and young women presidents. Kim came home very disturbed, and she explained what, the, what were they had been asked to do, and then she had written down this list of nine things, and Frankly, all but one of them were false, 
destructive and horrible. And um, so she said to me, Phil, I, I won't do this. I refuse. Kim's only refused twice to be compliant to church guidance or direction or counsel or request. This mm -hmm. is what the one of them. She said, I'm just going to go to the bishop and tell him I won't do this. I'm going to have to resign from my position. And I said, well, that doesn't solve the problem. The problem is this is going to be taught to all the youth in the state. So I went to the state president. We went over the list. I said, President, do you believe in any of this stuff? He said, no. I said, do you see this is helpful to the youth? He said, no. He said, but Phil, I don't, I don't know what to do. Um, um, general, by, the way, by the way, Philip, we're, we're, we're in a bit of a vacuum here because so far we have no idea as to what on this list is objectionable. Well, I'm going to tell you. Okay. The two most egregious teachings. Number one, <clears throat> the classic fornication is second only to murder in seriousness. Okay. Right. So if you've committed fornication, you're guilty of a sin that's almost murder. Um, that's number one. Dangerous, you better believe it, because some of those youth are going to have already sinned, right? Oh, sure. And you've told them now, they're not only a sinner, they're not only unworthy, they're almost murderers. Yeah. Um, there's nothing good about that at all. Number two, even worse than that. Is it possible? Yes. Even worse than that was they were supposed to teach the women, the, the, the girls, the young girls, that if they were raped or molested, that that made them impure and their chastity could not be restored. Wow. Now, in the first case, you know, I think it's a misinterpretation of Alma 39. There's that great article by Michael Ash called The Sin Next to Murder. Whether his interpretation is correct or not, I like it because that's a horrendous teaching. Right. Uh, he attributes the sin next to murder to the destruction of another person's faith and not fornication, right? Oh, so it's just, <laughs> so it's just what I'm doing. Thanks, Michael Ash. <laughs> Oh, that's right. I just figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> this time, uh, it's personal. Sorry for the condemnation. <laughs> that's okay. Um, um, but uh, but also, there's that part at the end of the Book of Mormon, right, where it talks about the Lamanites uh, cooking up fresh Nephite women. and. Well, it's, it's actually Moroni 9.9, and it's the reverse. It's Nephites molesting Lamanite women. Oh, that's right. That's right. Big role they, reversal at the end of the Yeah, of they're 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 – raping them and, and quote, taking that from them, which is most precious, even their chastity and virtue, then they be, then they torture them and behead them. I mean, gosh, it's just horrific. But this teaching that, um, that a molestation or a rape would deny a woman of purity, outrageous, absolutely outrageous. Right now, Kim, you know, you, I, I was trying to figure out what, why would he teach this? It's so nonsensical and crazy, right? I can tell you why. Well, my wife has a clue. What's yours? My clue is this. It's the same thing as a story about, I'd rather have you come home in a coffin. Absolutely. From your mission. It's all Absolutely. this, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, exaggeration. It's not necessarily euphemism, but um, there's a certain word that's escaping me, where we go overboard in describing something in order to scare those kids straight, right? So that they will never, ever get anywhere near doing this, you know, and they won't, you know, succumb. They'll, they'll fight off an attacker with everything they have, so they won't allow themselves to be abused. Or wow, it's amazing you said that, because last night when I was talking about this with Kim, she said to me, when I first joined the church... Several of the sisters said to me, if you're ever, if someone ever attempts to rape you or molest you, fight as hard as you can because, quote, it's better to die than to lose your chastity or virtue. Same idea, isn't it? With the idea there that if you survive, Philip, if you survive a sexual <laughs> assault, it's because you did not fight hard enough. With the implication oh, that there's an invitation there and a certain amount of wanting it. Yeah, so damaging, so dangerous, uh, such an unfair bu burden to put on a woman.
Oh, absolutely. But this this general authority who shall remain nameless because your wife doesn't want him named and we'll honor that here at Radio Free Mormon. That, um, But he wanted specifically, he was directing the stake president in your stake to make sure that um, all the youth and especially, it, it just sounds directed so much to the young women, but the youth without their parents present would be taught these principles. Right. The bishops, he, the bishops, the bishops were specifically commissioned to do this in each ward. The president felt he had to comply because it was a general authority. I asked him for permission. I said, sir, would you let me research these issues? Come back to you with a report on the truthfulness of these. And then if possible, uh, if you agree with me, would you let me intervene uh, and call elder? Uh, first of all, I asked him if he would call elder uh, so-and-so. Yes, elder so-and-so. Uh, elder you almost Smith, said it. Elder Smith. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and he said he didn't feel that he could do it. I said, would you let me do it? He said, yes. Yeah. So I, anyway, I, I had a friend who was a prominent church scholar, very knowledgeable. I went through every issue with him. We came up with statements from the, you know, from presidents of the church, you know, it appealed to higher authority. We debunked the eight out of the nine false teachings and statements, dangerous teachings. I went back to the president. Uh, I went through it. He absolutely agreed with the research and the conclusions. He gave me permission to call uh, Elder Smith, quote, unquote. And um, so I called him. You know, I introduced to myself. I'm so-and-so on the high council. We're following up on your, you know, direction to the bishops. There's a little confusion about some of these teachings. Can I go over them with you one by one and clarify so the right things are, are taught? And um, my memory, he backed off on every one of those issues except for the fornication is next to murder and seriousness. He, he clung to that. Uh, I can't remember specifically if he clung to the uh, molestation thing, which were the two super egregious ones. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I remember resistance on the, on the fornication next to murder. So I just thanked him for his time and uh went back to the president when i started reporting the conversation he just said oh this is foolishness we're not going to do it and so he just decided to not comply and if he got caught he would take the heat so that ended that um now what do we learn authoritarian church leadership especially if they're in error is extremely dangerous and potentially damaging and if somebody doesn't take a stand, this this stuff can hurt a lot of people, you know? Well, absolutely. And, of course, I think here you've got a general authority. He's over a lot of stakes, not just your stake. And how many other stakes was this implemented at his direction? And how many youth and other stakes were taught these principles as church gospel doctrine? Yeah, I don't have a clue. but Thousands. Um, it wasn't at a minimum it wasn't going to be taught to my girls right my young women mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't have i wouldn't have let them go to the meetings uh certainly with the best of my effort i was going to try to get it out of the stake that was the limit of my yeah ability so can i bring up something else here well, hey. you, because the vast majority of parents <clears throat> who have kids who would have gone to these meetings and who probably did in other stakes right they have no inside knowledge like you had as to what was going to be taught. It was only because I think of your wife and her access because she was a president in the Young Women's that she knew about it in advance, passed it on to you, and then you took action. God bless you, by the way. But the most, most parents would just be sending their kids to the meetings that they're supposed to go to. Okay, we're not supposed to be there. Fine, we won't be there. And they would be completely oblivious to the fact that these things are being taught to their children. Oh, yeah. But listen, my wife doesn't refuse stuff in the church hardly ever. Right. And and uh, she refused this because of the secrecy. In her mind, parents need to know what's going on with their children. Nothing in secret should happen to, to children without the parents being involved, number one. And then number two, just the, the egregiousness, the horrible nature of the teaching itself. So that's why she was going to opt out. Oh, right. And I appreciate that. But you hear the point that I'm making is that she was able to make that decision. Oh, yeah. You were because of the yeah. inside knowledge you yeah. had in advance Absolutely. of what was going to be taught. 
Yeah, absolutely. If yeah. I had found out after the fact, yeah, man, I'd have blown up the steak. I, I'd have, I'd have been furious um, to do that to one of my children without knowledge. Gee, uh, Bishop would have been limping for several months after that. <laughs> um, and a lot of a lot of children in the church have been taught that probably as a direct result of this incident as well as others like it and guess what parents were never the wiser for it they never knew because uh, uh, what kid is going to tell that to their parent not many i expect well listen that leads me into a similar story um i was in hawaii we were in hawaii i was on the high council there and <clears throat> the stake president who i you know solid guy he probably studied the scriptures more than any other priesthood leader i'd ever known and <clears throat> he decided and you know in hawaii they have a problem you have white members and polynesian members and for whatever reason um the polynesian members who are just lovely lovable loving fun people for whatever reason, they tended not to send their kids on missions or to have their children married in the temple at the same rate as, as white folks, right? So his goal was to increase the number of youth going on missions and the number of temple marriages in the state. That was his objective, a noble objective. His way to accomplish that was through a twofold program of requiring every family in the state to create a family mission statement where he determined the core elements of the mission statement, namely uh, doing a, a, a list of prescribed things that would result in your kids going on missions and your children being married in the temple. Does that make sense? Then in addition to controlling the family mission statements to accomplish what he wanted, he then began a series of, he wanted the, um, bishops to conduct really secret interviews with the youth where the bishops were to ask the youth questions about the way their parents ran the home do you have family home evening do you have prayer twice a day do you have scripture study because he felt if those things weren't going on then kids wouldn't go on missions and get married in the temple and he didn't think he would get honest answers from the parents so he was having the bishops interview the youth to report on the parents and then the parent the bishops were to write down the responses the high counselors were supposed to pick up these responses and then the state presidency was going to keep them on file so that when they did interviews for callings or temple recommends they'd be able to pull this report out it's inside information that get, they got through youth interviews so they could confront the adult members and then they could ask them the same question and when the parents say yeah we really are having family home evening the bishop can say, liar. Liar. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, obviously high counselors have to. So anyway, he decided to implement this program by starting with the leadership. So his requirement was that every member of the high council and every bishop submit their family mission statement. Okay. Mm -hmm. I did not submit one. And the first all the other high counselors submitted them. Then in the next high council meeting, he actually stood up and read several of them. These are supposed to be personal, private family mission statements, right? Oh, no. Right? Yeah. So he picked up one of the members of the high council. He, he reads the mission statement, and then he quizzes everybody. What's wrong with this one? What's wrong really? with this one? Oh, yeah. He said, he doesn't have this in there. He doesn't have that in there. You know, brother so-and-so, will you correct us? Oh, yes, sir, president. I'll correct that. Right? Yeah. Like, I'm going to have my family. I went home and told Kim, and she says, we're not having a family mission statement on parade, right? Yeah. And so I wouldn't submit a family mission statement, and I would not go to the bishops and pick up these uh, reports, written reports of interviews with the youth. Mm -hmm. So in a public priesthood meeting, stake, public stake priesthood meeting, he starts introducing this concept of the family mission statements to the rest of the stake, indicating that the stake leaders, namely high council and bishops, have already complied, except for one, except for one. Then he stared right at me as he says this. And he said, Did and not the side of your nose with your middle finger as you say back <laughs> <at him? laughs> 
He said, and that person <laughs> might <laughs> that person might be in jeopardy of losing their calling and maybe even their recommend. Okay. It was a public threat to oh me. Oh my gosh. So anyway, I thought this is getting dangerous because again, oh yeah, it's your whole I'm, livelihood. My, t my financial stability, my career is dependent on Temple Recommend. Oh, He's now threatened us. I load up my wife, who is an angel from heaven. Everyone knows it. He knows it. She has a halo when she walks. And I was absolutely convinced if she came with me and she explained to him why we were not in compliance, that he would agree. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I bring the angel in. She explains to him why to us a family mission statement is personal and private, that we are devoted to the church and we want to support our leaders, and, but we just can't do this in good conscience. He said to her, Brother and Sister McLemore, I'm telling you this. You are refusing to support your priesthood leader mm. as a result of this. You are in danger of being moved into a lower kingdom. You are forfeiting your exaltation and would be, are going to be placed in a lower kingdom. Now, later we used to refer to this as telestial number 346. But, <laughs> and, and of course you're resisting the temptation to say, well, as long as it's a kingdom where you're not, I'm good with it. By the way, if Listen. you read your New Testament, you would have known this would have happened because I think it was Jesus who said, if you will not believe Moses or the prophets, he will uh, not believe even should an angel appear to him. Well, he boom, didn't boom. believe. He didn't believe. Okay. So now I'm in trouble. So I call, I call my scholar friend who, um, is friends with and had regular meetings with elder Boyd Packer. I didn't know he, I explain, I called him to explain the problem. What should I do? What should I do? He says, I'm going to see elder Packer tomorrow. Let me ask him. So he mentioned this to elder Packer in a meeting and again, weirdo, weirdo situation. Why would elder Packer take my side against the state president's side, not knowing firsthand the situation, right? Mm -hmm. He just heard the details. He was furious, furious. He pounded. He, he said, I want the number of that stake president right now. I'm calling him. <laughs> well, Elder Packer was known for the nuclear option. Yeah. So he calls me back and he said, oh, gosh, Phil, Elder Packer wants um, your stake president's phone number. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I, it, it can't go this way. I've gone outside of the chain of command, right? I'm thinking, oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, no, no. I've gone outside the chain of command. If Elder Packer puts the nuke on him, uh, it's improper. It's going to create problems with me, the Church Military Relations Division. And, and um, you know, so I said, please, are you going to see Elder Packer in the next week or two? No. Can you? I'm not giving you the number. Uh, just pretend like you never had that conversation. I'm just going to assume he's going to get so busy he'll forget. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm going to call my general authority, in-line general authority supervisor, who at the time was Elder John Groberg. By the way, Elder Groberg is one peach of a human being. That's all I can say. Okay. Yeah. So I call. And he uh, married Anne Hathaway, didn't he? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I'm actually friends with his son, who's also a fabulous human being. But in any case, wing. Um, uh, so I called church headquarters. Uh, hey, I got a problem. Stake presence threatening to take my temper. Recommend that you know threatens my job. What, what do I do? What do I do? Again, I'm so surprised they're not saying, "Well, what what's wrong with you? What did you do?" Right? The stake presence, your inspired leader. Mm -hmm. Instead, uh, Elder Groberg says. Um, Oh, my, my, my. That doesn't sound good. He said, uh, Chaplain, I want you to be patient. He says, we're going to handle this, but we're slow. He said, I want you to give us two months. He says, within two months, we'll handle this. He said, in the meantime, if you really, really, really need a temple recommend, I'll send you one. <laughs> <laughs> he said, do not engage your stake president do not get into any conflict with him just be patient <laughs> so two months later elder Dieter Uchtdorf shows up in the stake um, sits down with the stake president 
leaves the next day. And when Elder Uchtdorf left, um, he left with two things in his briefcase, um, a interview, a secret interview program the bishops were conducting with their youth immediately terminated and a family mission president, pardon me, a family mission, <laughs> a family, <laughs> I'm losing it, a family mission statement program uh, controlled by the state president. Both of those programs were in his briefcase when he left. So in other words, he terminated them. And he was, this, the president was instructed to uh, uh, give me my temple recommend and to leave the chaplain in peace. Um, uh, the state president and I met, he gave me my temple recommend and he said to me, um, uh, elder brother, chaplain McLemore, I, I expect you know, support in this stake and in my position. I said, President, you absolutely have it. I I want to be supportive in every way possible. But listen, you know, I cannot and will not do things against my conscience and things that I believe are against the spirit of Christ. Period. Yeah, and don't yeah, and don't piss me off again or I'm calling Salt Lake. <laughs> <laughs> Heal. I did want to support him, and he did. He was, you know, you know, it's just, again, when you have authoritarian leadership and the leader, the leader becomes misguided in mm -hmm. some way, yes. the consequence can be extraordinary. So Elder Uchtdorf has to come down, whack his pee, pee but then he has to seek for a fig leaf from you by still demanding your allegiance to him. Which I gave under the said qualification. And, yeah. and again, you know, local leaders can get away with some unsavory things. I, I don't, you know, I've been in the church 50 years. These are rare occurrences. I mean, with, with one exception, all of my bishops have been fabulous human beings. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, but it just takes one case where a tremendous amount of damage can be done and local leaders can get away with a lot of nonsense unless somebody's willing to stand up and say, whoa, wait a minute. You yeah. know, wait a minute. Yeah. Cynthia Osmond saying, one bad bishop, don't spoil the whole bunch, girl. <laughs> well, listen, I've only got one more story, and I'm going to leave you in peace. How about that? Okay. Didn't you like my Dieter Uchtdorf impression? <laughs> when he came down to your state president, and he terminated him with extreme <laughs> prejudice. He does kind of sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I hadn't put that together before. Get the chopper. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me tell you this. Yeah. That was handled so masterfully by Elder Uchtdorf that the president was conciliatory toward me. Mm -hmm. He didn't feel undermined as a priesthood leader. I felt affirmed. I mean, Elder Uchtdorf was masterful in that. That's all I can say. Um, hey, last thing. Okay. And you can cross me up. Toss me across enemy lines back into the fray. Um, <clears throat> I had a, a very interesting experience some years ago. I, I became, through an interesting circumstance, I became friends with one, or, with one of Elder Bruce R. McConkie's brothers. Is that Oscar by any chance? No. Okay. I know he has a few brothers. Oscar I've heard of. I think he was a lawyer too. Well, actually, several of the brothers were lawyers. Ah. Um, family curse, I guess. Um, oops. Hey, hey. Oops. Um, but you don't want to say which brother it was? Nah, I, 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 no, I, no. Okay, so we know it wasn't Bruce, and we know it wasn't oh, Oscar. We're going to do a process of elimination. Of elimination. Uh, <laughs> Jinx. All right, go ahead. We, uh, so anyway. This is the brother of Elder Bruce R. McConkie. Yeah, so anyway, as our friendship develops, and we're talking and sharing church stories and different things, he says to me, hey, I've got a letter book uh, where we've collected letters, personal and private letters that, that uh, Bruce sent out to family members. And then apparently he would uh, regularly send out a letter, just, you know, kind of a view from the top. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Here's what's going on. Here's my Like point a of Christmas view. letter? Here's my counsel. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my Christmas letter to my members of my family. The view from the top is an apostle. So, uh, and, and, some of these letters were written when he was uh, 70, um, 
I presume some when he was an apostle. I can't remember, but um, two things stuck out to me. Number one, um, I ran across some personal letters that he had written to his wife. Mm -hmm. I was absolutely flabbergasted. These were intimate, romantic, loving, tender letters and expressions of deep, deep devotion and affection. I, you know, I was used to the fire breathing, um, church correcting, punishing, you know, Gene England, George Pace, Bruce McConkey, right? Yes. Damning people for not believing in the right doctrines or, and so on and so forth. All of a sudden, here's this other side, tender, loving, affectionate. I mean, it was just uh, uh, heartwarming and impressive that that side of him was there. So no. I, I really, really appreciated that. Well, Hitler loved his dog. <laughs> oh, no. Bad RFM, bad that's RFM. Ter that's terrible on too many levels. I'm sorry about that. Okay. And then, surprisingly, I ran across a letter where one of the family members, in reference to Paul Dunn, had asked if Elder McConkie had had any experiences like Elder Dunn had had. So you remember the um, call from a prophet, you know, his experience with President McKay. Remember how dramatic that was portrayed? Yes? I have a vague recollection. Yes. Oh, yeah. He, he talked about his calling to be a general, as a general authority. There was a whole tape called Call from a Prophet. Mm -hmm. And uh, very dramatic, very miraculous. And, <clears throat> and of course, all the other stories that Elder Dunn told. And so he had a family member, whether it was a child or grandchild, I can't remember, wanting Elder McConkie to, to share if he or any of the other brethren uh, had or were having similar sorts of experiences. Now, being an attorney, Elder McConkie's response was very carefully worded to avoid um, a, a, you know, a kind of criticism of Elder Dunn that could be used in a pointed way. Yes. But the message was crystal clear. Yeah. This does not happen. I haven't experienced it. The other brethren haven't experienced it. Uh, sometimes people exaggerate things a bit. You know, a bit is, is an understatement. But he absolutely communicated to his family that, that he disapproved of these kinds of uh, accounts and reports and sensationalistic teaching. And, um, and then I realized that Ellen McConkie didn't trade in these sorts of things. You know what I'm saying? No, he does. He doesn't, but he also seems to be, um, sort of envious of others who either have or report these special spiritual experiences or maybe are popular because they're teaching things at BYU as a professor. He almost oh. seems to sometimes suffer from priesthood envy. Well, yeah, I, I can see how it would be seen that way. I, uh, I do, I do not like the way George Pace was publicly humiliated. I do not like the way that Gene England was trampled on. Yeah. Um, no question about it. it I, I did. I liked Elder McConkie because he he preached. You know, we lost the preaching tradition in Mormonism many years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we loved Elder Legrand Richards because he preached. You know what yes. I'm saying? He yes. didn't give talks. Right. He didn't read talks. He preached. And and uh, Elder McConkie didn't rely on on sensationalism or fabrication. He relied on the preaching of the word as he understood it. You know. Yes, and very and, much my way or the highway. <laughs> and for a long time, I was in his way, and so I kind of appreciated the the, the firmness of that. But, but interesting in the letter that he's really uh, admitting that. He hasn't experienced anything like Paul Dunn's talking, any of these wonder stories, and none right. of the other brethren have, that he knows of have experienced anything like it either. Right. Yeah. Right. And that presents its own issue when you're claiming the spiritual gifts of the primitive church. Well, right. And in his final testimony in April of 1985 in General Conference, Bruce R. McConkie once again used language that was yep. suggestive of the idea yep. that he had already seen 
Jesus Christ. He said, I will, you know, in a future day, yep. I will, I will uh, bathe his feet with my tears, but I will not know then any more surely than I know now. Yep. And I, I, th- yeah, I think that's the closest he ever came to a statement, to a, an expression like that. Um, it certainly didn't characterize his teaching overall, but he did, he did, uh, and that's probably how he felt at the end, but I, I don't think he was implying that he had had some meeting and, oh, hey, so, you know, I saw you for lunch last week. Glad to see you again. So <laughs> um, anyway, I, I appreciated those two aspects about him. Yeah, I, I've already expressed what I didn't appreciate um, because, again, false teaching hammered in with a nail can be harmful. Um, the last kind of story here, and this was the dark side of the – Now, Philip – I just want to I just want to preface this right now. We have got actually eight minutes until President Nelson's going to be addressing the world with his message of hope and healing. We are recording this on Friday, November 20th, 2020. There's a much anticipated message that President Nelson will be giving. It's been promoted. It's been expected. It's going to be happening here now in seven minutes. Can you finish this up in three? Oh, yeah. Go for I it. I didn't know that was coming. Well, I don't want you to miss it. I'm glad I told you. Yeah, we could end now. It's, um, I'd rather end positive then. <laughs> no, no. My, my audience would rather have you end negative. Go ahead. <laughs> well, anyway, in the conversation with his brother who had served as a mission president and who had uh, in a formal way and then had served as a kind of an informal director of, of uh, missionary activities – in a specialized situation. Uh, I don't know if you remember when um, after the Vietnam War, some Cambodian, a whole bunch of Cambodians came over to America and the church uh, took in a lot of those folks to provide basic needs until they could be rehomed, so to Mm. speak. And so the church had um, custody is not right, the, the right word, but care for and access to, um, a, a, a large group of Cambodians, and and his brother was uh, responsible for uh, missionary work and teaching them the gospel. And uh, I was a little surprised when he bragged and talked about how they had sent missionaries in that these people didn't even really speak English. They really didn't even understand what they were being taught and what was going on, but. By golly, they baptized over 500 Cambodians, okay? Yeah, the numbers are important. And I was kind of stunned. And I, you know, I liked him. And I was so grateful with so many of the things he had shared that I found inspiring. I didn't have the courage to say, what are you, are you kidding? This is crazy. I just kind of let it go. And uh, again, it's that, it's that lesson, that growth is more important than ethical behavior, you know what I'm saying, than fair treatment of other human beings, which is a, as a fallback to all those crazy mission stories I told last time. Um, I just wish we wouldn't do that kind of thing. Well, and so, I understand what you're saying, and there's almost this sort of uh, shadow that goes along with this, this idea of uh, baptizing people. And even if they don't really understand or if they think they're joining a baseball team or whatever it is, right, there's almost this shadow that goes along with this idea. that, And the shadow is that if we took the time to actually teach them what we believe, then they wouldn't join. And then there's the, and then there's the I, I think the rationalization that, and I've heard this. Well, they're going to get the Holy Ghost, and once they get the Holy Ghost, then they're really going to understand. So we're actually blessing them, right? Right, and that's why the inactivity rate among those people who get baptized that way is so low. It's outrageous. I mean, yeah. gosh, they sent Elder Holland to wherever it was, Chile. He dissolved dozens of stakes because the the inactivity rate was ninety percent. Hmm. Yep. And Holy Ghost sleeping on the job again. My goodness. So, gosh, I hate to end negative. Um, fortunately, you can fortunately. say something nice about me at the end. That would be positive. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, I love your work. I appreciate what you're doing. I, I really do. Um, um, your analysis is important. Uh, your sarcasm might go a touch too far now and then, but the humor is deeply appreciated because we need some humor in 
in some of these situations they're they're so tragic at times well and, thank you yes go ahead yeah and we there are people like my wife she will never submit to uh unethical or dishonest behavior she serves with a christ-like heart and uplifts and blesses people at the local level so um that is also present in the church and i'm, I'm grateful for that uh in spite of my rebelliousness here and there that's about all for tonight until next time this is radio free mormon signing off the air